Yes. Yes. Let me officially call to order the March quarterly meeting of the Tennessee Board of Regents and let me start by welcoming everyone here and thanking you for coming to the central office to uh, be a part of this meeting. Uh, I also want to officially acknowledge and welcome our governor, uh, Governor Bill Haslam, uh, who, as I've said in the past, has placed a tremendous emphasis on uh, higher education or education in general uh, for the state, and that, that is illustrated by his uh, presence at this meeting, and we appreciate uh, the governor being with us uh, today. Uh, if you have picked up a copy of our agenda, excuse me, you will see that we have a full agenda, uh, a lot to be covered, uh, and we hope uh, to cover it as expeditiously as possible, but uh, 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 we will be working uh, to get through it. I want to personally thank uh, those in the central office, team members, as well as our team members uh, on our various campuses for the work that they have done. And as I always do, I remind uh, everyone that uh, we do have these cameras uh, here in our room. It's not just because I want to sit back and look at myself later to see how the meeting went, but we're being webcast. <laughs> Uh, for the public, uh, which I think is a tremendous benefit to our citizens to see the action of how various boards uh, work. Uh, and speaking with the governor earlier, he had asked that I uh, conduct the meeting, uh, and I will uh, do so accordingly. Uh, as your, your vice chair, uh, and uh, that having been said, uh, uh, I would uh, call on uh, Chancellor Morgan uh, for any uh, additional comments uh, that he would have uh, at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, are we uh, trying to get on script here? The, uh, uh, at, at this point, I'll reserve my comments. We have as you say, we have a full agenda, and we have a particularly special thing that we're going to do early on in the meeting. So uh, I will save my remarks until a little bit later and then perhaps be involved in the conversation around the informational items that, that come up later yes. in the agenda. Okay. At this time, I would also like to introduce and acknowledge, is there any uh, media other than our uh, webcast present? Uh, presenters here with us. Okay. Realizing that there are none at this time, I will call on our Secretary and General Counsel, Chris Modisher, to call the roll. Governor Haslam. Here. Regent Copeland. Here. Regent Duckett. Here. Regent Ferris. Here. Regent Gatz. Here. Regent Griscom. Here. Regent Huffman. Here. Regent Markham. Regent Montgomery, Here. Regent Reynolds, Here. Regent Roddy, Here. Regent Thomas, Here. Regent Varlin, Here. Regent Weeks. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Secretary. First item on the agenda is the presentation of service <coughs> awards. Uh, uh, at this time, I will call on Chancellor Morgan uh, to uh, make initial comments and as part of the presentation, uh, uh, the chancellor, myself, as well as the governor and the recipients, we will uh, move forward uh, for a photo opportunity as the awards are presented. Yeah, it, it, it is very exciting for us to, uh, to, to be able to do this. I think this may be the first time, or at least first time in a long time, that we have done this uh, this way. Um, but what you have at the, at the central office of the Tennessee Board of Regents is a staff who works hard every day to accomplish the mission of this system, to support our institutions, to support the idea of student success and improving education attainment in Tennessee. So we thought it would be nice if we could recognize uh, through service awards uh, that service and do it here at this place, and it's particularly uh, 
uh, exciting that the governor's here to participate in this. Um, so what we'd like to do, and we'll try to move quickly through this because we do have a long agenda, but it's to recognize employees that have service that ranges from five years to 45 years. And if you add it all up together, <clears throat> it's 335 years of service. And as you'll understand a little bit better in just a minute, 300 years of that service is really credible. Uh, 30, <clears throat> 35 of it may be a little bit questionable. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so, so you'll learn more about that in just a minute. So it is, it is exciting for us to be able to do this uh, in, in this setting. Uh, and I would ask April to come up and uh, uh, call the names, and then we're going to do a, a certificate and a picture. So thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Morgan. While I've been employed in higher education for 23 years, I confess I feel a bit out of place standing here today introducing staff service recipient awards when I myself am a relative newcomer to the state of Tennessee. However, while I've been with TBR for only about 15 months, I can certainly see why others have been here for 15 years, or in some cases, as you'll hear in just a moment, much longer than that. What I found working here at TBR is that it's comprised of wonderful people. People with strong work ethics and a genuine sense of loyalty and dedication. Each of this year's recipients is a reflection of those qualities. Now, I will introduce this year's award recipients there were 23 Central Office Tennessee Board of Regents employees that were eligible for service awards as of 2011. 19 are here with us today to be recognized and receive the recipient awards. Due to the number of awards, um, I ask that you please hold your applause until the end and then really give it up for them and their years of service. Okay? <laughs> To the award recipients, please stand as I call your name and come forward to be recognized and receive your award. Celebrating five years of service, Mickey Sheen, Manager of Paralegal Services, Office of the General Counsel. Brian Sunday Booth, ROCC Technical Support Coordinator, Regents Online Collaborative. Callie Wise, TSIDS Coordinator, Regents Online Campus Collaborative. John York, Account Clerk 3, Business and Finance. Deanna Morris-Stacy, Administrative Assistant 3, Access and Diversity. And now celebrating 10 years of service, Dr. Pyla Myrick Short, Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Academic Affairs. William Arnold, Director of Access and Diversity from the Department of Access and Diversity. Linda Ludwig, Administrative Assistant 1, System-Wide Internal Audit. Raylene Henry, Associate Vice Chancellor for ROCC, Regents Online Campus Collaborative. Gary Stortz, Instructional Design and Developer, Regents Online Collaborative and John Townsend, Executive Director, Workforce Development, Office of Community Colleges. Thank you, sir. Celebrating 15 years, Helen Vose, Internal Auditor from System-Wide Internal Audit. And Keith King, Director of Project Management, Administration and Facilities Development. Celebrating 20 years, Margaret Mason, Manager of Information Systems, Information Technology. Celebrating 25 years, Deanna Hall, Director of Fiscal Services, Business and Finance. Celebrating 30 years, Tammy Burchett, Director of System-Wide Internal Audit from the Department of System-Wide Internal Audit. After 
celebrating 35 years, Chancellor John Morgan. <laughs> Also celebrating 35 years, Keith Robinson, Director of Construction Management Administration Facilities. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Your Thank you. And celebrating 45 years of service to the state of Tennessee, Pat Massey, Administrative Assistant 3, Business and Finance. This concludes this year's list of service awards for the Central Office employees. Now let's honor and thank all of them for their dedication and service. Thank, thank you, April. And okay, all of us are thinking there is no way 45 years. <laughs> seriously, the old joke about starting when you were seven, I think, <laughs> seriously. Hey, I want to thank all of you on behalf of the state of Tennessee. Uh, that is, uh, it's incredibly important that we have great men and women work for us and are willing to commit to doing that. And uh, we are grateful, and hopefully you feel like uh, what is true, uh, that you made a significant difference in the, the future of the state of Tennessee by helping uh, provide great education. So on behalf of uh, six and a half million Tennesseans uh, and uh, scores of and thousands of folks who you've helped get great education, thank you very, very much. And did want to acknowledge uh, our chancellor, if I may make a few, uh, few uh, comments. Uh, back in 1976, a young 24-year-old first came to work for the state. Now, if I'm doing my math right, that means this is a big birthday year, right? Starts with a sun, starts with a sun instead of a fuss. So, so that's yeah. <laughs> if I did my math right, but uh, started uh, working for the state in '76. Went to the comptroller's office in '82, and then was elected comptroller of the treasury in 1999. And I can say for my position now, that's an incredibly important uh, role for the state uh, in all that we need and expect the comptroller to do. Uh, and then he held that post for 10 years until Governor Bredesen asked him to come be the deputy governor in January of, I guess, 2009, if I, if I know it's right, uh, and served really well there and then came to, uh, to TBR, as you all know, in September of 2010. I'll say this about John. Uh, back when I was a brand new mayor in 2004 in Knoxville, so eight years ago, one of the very first conversations I had with John, he's comptroller at that point in time, uh, but was about education and the changes we needed to make in Tennessee from pre-K all the way up through graduate degrees and a real focus there. And he's played a critical role in helping us as we fought through a reform in education from his first in his role in Comptroller's office where he didn't have to take that on, uh, but he did. And then now obviously with higher ed and uh, everything from complete college to helping us understand how to increase access for students uh, from throughout the state of all different backgrounds. So John, thank you very much for your service. Congratulations on behalf of the state of Tennessee. Like I said, we're grateful for your 35 years. Thank you, Governor, and I would be remiss on behalf of the board if I did not uh, extend uh, congratulations to all of the uh, uh, individuals as well who received their recognition today because, uh, as we all know, a lot of work goes into uh, the efforts uh, of providing the services here uh, at our various institutions. And so uh, congratulations, and uh, I'm still amazed uh, Pat with those 45 years, but we enough said about that one. Yeah. Uh, moving on with the, uh, the agenda uh, at this time, uh, the next item is the uh, approval of the uh, minutes, uh, and members uh, have minutes from the December 8th regularly uh, quarterly board meeting as well as the February 23rd and the uh, March 21st special call session. Uh, those minutes were provided to you uh, 
previous prior to this uh, to us arriving does anyone have any changes or corrections to the minutes that have been provided here in nine is there a motion to accept those minutes so moved. second it was motion by Regent Montgomery second by Governor Haslam any discussion uh, all in favor signify by aye, aye. Poses the same. Moving to the interim action report, uh, uh, Chancellor Morgan, uh, are there any items as it relates to the interim actions that have been taken uh, between last board meeting and this one uh, that you'd like to make comments on? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's nothing in particular. I think you have had the uh, uh, report since March 23rd. Uh, the uh, items that are included in the interim action report are, are those that are typically in that report that you see uh, every quarter. And pending any questions, I would recommend the board approve uh, the report of interim action. You've heard the Chancellor's uh, recommendation. Is there a motion to approve the interim action? It, it was moved by Regent Gett, second by Regent Varlin. Any discussion? Chairman? Yes, Regent I, Thomas. I have, I have a question. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I noticed uh, about on the chart of the appointments, uh, the uh, head football coach at the University of Memphis, it says 167,000, quote, of Prince's base. Uh, and then I noticed a bunch of assistant football coaches that make 300,000 to 200,000. Uh, what is what is that? Uh, the, the head football coach is 167,000. What what is what, what's what's under the base? Um, what that represents is the amount, and, and Dr. Raines is here and can correct me if I misstate this, but uh, what that represents is the amount that is actually paid from university funds to the to the head football coach. The head football coach at Memphis, just like other you know big football schools. Uh, has a variety of other kinds of arrangements that supplement that compensation, but it does not come from direct university funds. So that's what that represents. His total package is worth quite a bit more than $167,000. Correct. Okay, and the assistant football coach, Barry Odom, who makes 300000 is that all state funds? Those, the, the amounts that are listed uh, for the, on this, on this uh, interim action report are the amount of state funds that are paid to those coaches. When this is a little bit of a unique situation in that we had a head coaching change that caused uh, a turnover in a bunch of positions, uh, as you might expect with a new head coach. So you're seeing kind of all at one time the roster of, of coaching that uh, we, we tend to deal with on a piecemeal basis where you have a head coach who's been there and his coaches come, coaches go. So it, so it, looks, you know, it, it looks pretty impressive because it's all, all at one time. Um, but when those come to us, we look at uh, the, the salary that's being proposed, how that compares with comparable schools uh, within that conference and within the next conference up, I think we look. Uh, and, and in every case, you know, we approve those based on the the belief that in the context of big time college football, they are reasonable salaries. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none, it has been properly moved and second for approval of the inter interim action report. All in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposes the same. Thank you. Interim action report is approved. Next, moving to the report of the committees. Uh, board members have received the finance and business operations uh, March 9th as well as March 1st uh, 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 reports. They have also received the audit committee report from March 13th. Uh, does anyone uh, have any comments or objection to uh, the minutes that have been received. Move they be approved. <clears throat> Motion has been made by Governor Haslam for the approval. Is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Thomas. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed is the same. Thank you. The committee re reports are approved. Uh, at this time, we will turn to the report uh, of the chancellor. This item requ requires no action on our part. Uh, however, the floor, uh, we, I turn the floor over to you, Chancellor. Thank you, and I'll, I'll be very brief, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I say, I, I may want to participate in a later conversation. Um, there are some people here that I just wanted to recognize. I, I think they're here. I hadn't necessarily made eye contact with everybody yet, but uh, uh, Jerry Faulkner, I believe, is here. Yes. Um, Dr. Jerry Faulkner uh, is the newly appointed uh, president of Volunteer State Community College. Um, he will take over the presidency there on, on May 15th. We also uh, have with us, uh, for, our first, for the first time for him to be in this capacity in this meeting, uh, President Brian Nolan, who took over at ETSU on January 15th. Um, most of you, I think, already know uh, President Nolan from his work at THEC, uh, but for, for those who don't, that's, that's what he looks like. Uh, <clears throat> and we're, we're very glad that he is here. And also with us is Dr. Lynn Kreider, the newly appointed director of the Tennessee Technology Center uh, at Murfreesboro, uh, who will begin his new role uh, on April 1st. Uh, and I don't think there's anybody any happier about that than Carol Perrier, who has been, <laughs> has been doing dual, kind of dual duty. Uh, so, uh, so those are, are three uh, new faces in a way that you will be seeing, uh, hopefully for the years to come in, in these meetings. And I just wanted to, to, to welcome them. Uh, one other announcement I would make uh, is uh, Mr. Sean Oceanbaum, who y'all remember was uh, a student regent, uh, just received notification that he had been admitted to medical school at ETSU uh, and will begin this fall. So I, I know that, that Joseph, those of you who worked with Sean would be very proud of, uh, of his continued progress. A um, couple other things briefly. Uh, you have in front of you, uh, <clears throat> I think, a report uh, that is the uh, Proceedings of the Second Annual Research Researcher Development Conference. And this is a project that uh, Dr. Short and her staff, but primarily Dr. Short, started last year to really bring together faculty from our institutions who are not normally necessarily engaged in, in in intensive research kind of activities, uh, but research is an important part of higher education, uh, even on the academic side of higher education. Uh, continued engagement, expansion of, of a faculty member's knowledge in their area, contributing uh, to the knowledge base uh, is an important part of being uh, an effective faculty member. Uh, and Dr. Short had, had uh, pulled together at this conference. This was a second annual conference. It was a great success, uh, as was last year's. Uh, and I would commend this to you to take a look at uh, when you have an opportunity to see the kinds of things uh, that are going on uh, at our institutions. I think uh, you will feel, as I do, you'll feel quite proud uh, of the scholarship uh, that's represented by faculty uh, at, our at our institutions. Two other very brief things. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I was, uh, had the opportunity to participate in a, a meeting earlier this week of, of business leaders from across the, the state of Tennessee, particularly those who are entrepreneurs and involved in uh, really growing businesses and business startups, along with uh, colleagues from uh, other higher education systems uh, in the state and other institutions. And it was a great chance to, for, for me to understand uh, in a clearer way the potential role for our institutions to play uh, in terms of discovery uh, leading to potential uh, for commercialization. Um, there is a lot of activity going on, but there's a lot more activity that can go on. One of the things that we are involved in, and, and, and the timing of this was, was really quite fortuitous, is a grant application uh, that will uh, be a joint application. I think it's ended up with MTSU, Tennessee Tech, and ETSU. Uh, to uh, the Economic Development Administration for support uh, in building a framework within which that kind of work can be done more effectively uh, on our on our campuses. So that that is a, I think, a very exciting prospect for uh, for the future for our, our campuses. Uh, one other thing I'll mention to you: we've been working today with uh, Tennessee State University as they uh, kind of put the final touches on their application to create a charter school uh, here in metropolitan uh, Davidson County. 
Um, this is an application that really would put them in a position to begin to plan. It would be at least a planning year before that school would become operational. Um, but that also is something that has uh, generated quite a bit of excitement on the campus and a, and a unification around a cause that uh, has a potential for being a, an important uh, aspect of, of their programming and, and uh, all the way from obviously College of Education but also throughout their other colleges and, and, and the opportunities to, to be engaged in that kind of, of, of activity in their community. So we'll see how that plays. We'll report back to you uh, on how that plays out over time. Um, so that, Mr. Chairman, that is my report and I'd be glad to answer any questions about that or uh, anything else that you might have. Yes, uh, John, how do you feel at the end of this first year with the Complete College Act, uh, how our institutions did? Were you pleased with the performance? Uh, are there some areas that we need to look at and be thinking about going forward? I think it would be useful just to get that, that kind of an overview. Sure, and, and, and Regent Griscom, if we could, if I could defer that conversation to the informational reports, um, that's, that is in large part what we're going to talk about. We'll be able to show you pictures. Of, of how we're doing and really talk about kind of on a going forward basis how this board may wish to view our progress toward meeting the goals of complete college. So so we're going to talk about that if I ever stop talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in particular, uh, I believe it's Vice Chancellor uh, uh, Wendy Thompson is going to give us some additional information As on that. Dale, yeah. And Dale, yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments of the Chancellor related to his report? Thank you. Next, we'll, we will move to reports of the presidents and directors. First, I'd called on uh, Director Brad White uh, for the report on, uh, from the uh, technology centers. Director White. Thank you, uh, Governor Haslam, Vice Chairman Duckett. Chancellor Morgan, Regents, uh, hope you're having a good afternoon. I'd like to start off my report <clears throat> by giving you a little update on some things that's happened. Uh, you know, Mr. King travels quite a bit, and he was seated uh, next to a boastful Texan. And everything Mr. King brought up about education and travel and schools, it was always bigger and better in Texas. And he told the Texan about growing up on a farm in West Tennessee, and the Texan just laughed, and he said, you know, I've got a ranch in Texas. I can get in my truck and drive all day and not get across it. And James said, I used to have a truck like that. <laughs> if you would look at uh, your highlights for the technology centers, you'll see that uh, Community College Weekly had an article, A Model of Success, Tennessee Technology Centers Offer Clues to Achieving High Graduation Rates. It's an interesting article uh, if you have a chance to read it. Uh, Chancellor Morgan may mention that nobody was happier for Dr. Perrier to be back at the central office than her, but I think Mr. King may be a little bit happier than she is that she's back full time. Uh, we would, uh, as a group, like to welcome Dr. Kreider uh, back to Tennessee. Uh, I remember when he was at Jackson at the McWhorter Center, and we look forward to working with him. Uh, of interest and astonishment to me is the retirement of Jeff Davis from TTC Knoxville. I'm not so surprised he's retired or retiring. He will finish his tenure May 31st. He'll have 38 years in when he retires. That's not surprising to me. Uh, what's surprising to me is at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning in Naples, Florida, he will be getting married. <laughs> and that he's at the board meeting today. Uh, we'd, as Jeff uh, starts a new phase of his life, uh, Dwight Murphy, director at um, Huntsville Oneida, will be the interim director at Knoxville. So we uh, wish him the best. TTC's had a wonderful statewide in-service last week, and an American Technical Education Conference uh, was also held. It was very successful. The TTC's will be hosting the American Technical Education Association Conference in Chattanooga next year. 
outstanding student finalist. Uh, would like to mention their names, Sarah Wyatt from Crossville, Tavis Enlow from Murfreesboro, Daniel Latham from Livingston, Patricia Savory from Elizabethton, Tresha Rucker from Memphis, and Greg Patrick and Ripley from Ripley. We wish them the best. Uh, one of them will be selected as the Outstanding Student of the Year for the TTCs. TTC Nashville received a $50,000 donation from Dr. and Mrs. Ernest DeWald to purchase equipment to start a new dental assisting program. Uh, I was afraid this was going to be the TTC Pulaski show when I started getting stuff in to talk about. Um, Jim Dixon's always on the go. Uh, TTC Pulaski will be unveiling their, um, in their solar voltaic trailer they have put together that produces 2,400 watts of solar power where they can take it to work sites or even power a home strictly by solar. Uh, they will be unveiling this uh, Monday, April 2nd, downtown Pulaski, next to the electric vehicle charging station. So uh, that's going to be something, and that's also in your uh, newsletter. Uh, tomorrow, Pulaski will be hosting the uh, secondary welding competition. Uh, for eight counties for all juniors and seniors. Um, in Jackson, uh, ARJ Manufacturing, who manufacture, they're part of a uh, subsidiary of Toyota. They manufacture um, seating components for Toyota, has entered into an agreement with TTC Jackson's Tool and Die program that the students will be trained there to Tool and Die program uh, they will work two or three days as a temporary employee while attending school, and once they complete the program, they have been guaranteed full-time employment at ARJ. Uh, back to TTC Knoxville, um, there's an article in Practical Welding today. The title of it is Three's Company, and it's not about the sitcom. Um, a deaf student, a welding instructor, and an interpreter make a good team and this uh, welding is uh, is visual as well as sound when you have to uh, I've, I've done welding and I'm very bad at it uh, so I know how important it is that this student who can't hear is picking up the vibrations and the senses from the weld and is being very successful at it and it's a good article if you uh, have a chance to look at that. And then um, Livingston has raised $4,500 for their foundation. TTC McKenzie received the uh, Lowe's $10,000 Lowe's grant. They used that grant, and this was a little odd to me at first, to build a playground at an elementary school in Milan. Now, why our green electronics program was building a playground, I, w I had the question. This playground has a solar cell that as it takes the sun and powers the battery, it also makes shade for the teachers while they're watching the students on the playground. The welding program uh, built the parallel bars and the things for the cells. The uh, collision repair program in Paris painted. The CIT program McKinsey built a computer that sets in mineral oil, looks like an aquarium, inside the school so the students can look at how much electricity is being generated. And it gives a chart, they may have done that for me, and says 75 light bulbs can be lit with this right now in the hallway of the school. Uh, it was something to see two schools and four programs get together to do something. Uh, this was supposed to be unveiled tomorrow. It was unveiled a week ago, they finished early. But to see the solar cells, the computers, and all the work is something to see. And last, um, TTC Paris had its 40th anniversary on the 8th. And that's not big news in itself, although we did have the daughters of uh, former late representative W.J. Neese, who the school is named after. Uh, one of them drove up from Mississippi and one drove in from Kentucky to be with us that day and spoke. The interesting part of this uh, anniversary was that uh, Mr. King was there. It's a three-hour drive from Paris back to Murfreesboro. 
And Mr. King told me sometime after this was over that it took him over six and a half hours to get home. And all I can say is if he'd let us, we'll fix that truck for him. <laughs> That's you. all I have if uh, there's any questions. Thank you, uh, Director White. Are there any questions of Director White? Thank you, sir. Next, we will have the uh, report from the community colleges and President uh, Wade McCamey. Thank you, Vice Chair Duckett, Governor Haslam, Chancellor Morgan, members of the Board of Regents, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to address you on behalf of Tennessee's community colleges. And that particular title, by the way, is the lead marketing message resulting from the Complete College Tennessee's initiative. As you will note in the community college report made available to you today, this issue focuses on highly successful education programs at Tennessee's community colleges. And while community colleges across the nation have taken a hit in data reports pertaining to retention and graduation, significant is the fact that when compared to other selective admissions cohort-based technical training programs, you will find the retention completion and placement rates for the academic programs highlighted in this report that they compare very favorable with the goals set forth in the Complete College Tennessee Act. Also consistent with the Complete College Tennessee Act, the leadership provided by Chancellor Morgan and Vice Chancellor Nichols in developing strategic planning priorities for community colleges is superb. And as most of you know, Tennessee's college completion academies were conducted in the fall and another round will take place next week. These workshop academies provide tremendous opportunities for institutions to better focus on retention, graduation, and other strategic initiatives. Community college presidents are also appreciative of the TBR leadership in directing a very successful retreat at the Renaissance Center in January. Another area of noted success for Tennessee community colleges is the progress being made in the statewide marketing initiatives. The feedback from the steering committee indicates that the consulting firm of Lovell Communications is doing an excellent job in facilitating this initiative. And again, the collective support of Chancellor Morgan and Vice Chancellor Nichols has been out noteworthy. And this very day, select student focus groups on Tennessee's community college campuses are taking place to glean further information for future direction setting. I'm also pleased to report that Tennessee's community colleges once again honored outstanding Phi Theta Kappa students in February with a recognition luncheon held in Nashville. 26 outstanding Tennessee Board of Regents students were added to the all Tennessee Phi Theta Kappa academic team and were presented a Tennessee General Assembly resolution by Lieutenant Governor Ron Ramsey. And significant also is the fact that the Phi Theta Kappa International Convention will be taking place at the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, April 12 through 14, and literally thousands of people will be coming from around the world to this convention. I'd especially like to thank President Janice Gillum for her leadership role this year in guiding the Phi Theta Kappa Initiative, and at your desk or at your seat, you should find a view book of the All, uh, All Tennessee Academic Team. And lastly, I'd like also to join the Chancellor and others in welcoming Dr. Brian Nolan, as the new president of ETSU, Dr. Jerry Faulkner is the new president of All State, and Dr. Lynn Kreider is the new director of the Tennessee Technology Center at Murfreesboro. And Mr. Chair, thank you again for this opportunity, and I will await any questions. Thank you, President McCamey. Uh, any questions, comments? Hearing none, we appreciate the update. Thank you very much. Given the report on behalf of the uh, universities, we have President Sidney McPhee. Thank you, Governor Haslam, Vice Chairman Duckett, distinguished members of this board, Chancellor Morgan, and colleagues. Good afternoon. On behalf of my colleagues at our university, I appreciate the opportunity to give this brief update about the exciting things that are happening on our campuses throughout our state or part of the Tennessee Board of Regents since the last time this board convened. As part of my report, you'll find in your packet the most recent edition of High Science, and might add 
in color. In color. Uh, this um, handout includes much more detailed information regarding significant accomplishments and recent events at our universities. With April being just around the corner, the spring 2012 semester is coming to a close, and it appears that all of our four-year institutions have had a very productive academic year thus far. Let's start first with the University of Memphis. The University of Memphis Intermodal Flight Transportation Institute in, in a consortium partnership with the University of Wisconsin Madison was designated as a tier one university transportation center by the US Department of Transportation. The program awards grants to university across the United States to advance the state of the art research in transportation and to develop the next generation of transportation professionals. The U of M was one of 46 applicants completing to be one of 10 tier one centers, a remarkable accomplishment. And in January, President Reigns and our Honorable Governor, Chancellor Manning, and many of our board members here today join in raising the U of M, Tennessee, and U.S. flags over the Jackson, Tennessee, Lambeth campus. This formally signified that the campus association with the University of Memphis became a part of the family of that great institution. The university began offering classes at the former Lambeth Institution in the fall of 2011. And in spring 2012, the Lambeth campus enrollment is 331, and more than 500 applications have already been received for the fall 2012 enrollment at the Jackson campus. Now, moving to the middle region of our state, at Austin P. State University, two facility projects are in the works. Recently at Austin P., Austin P. received a grant of more than $1.78 million to build safe rooms in the basement of three new residence hall now under construction. This project is in part supported by funds from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management, and the Tennessee Emergency and Management Agency. The safe rooms are designed to protect students from inclement weather, such as strong winds and tornadoes. And Austin P. will also be breaking ground for the new math and computer science building. This is a $6.7 million facility, which will house two of Austin P.'s growing departments. And the College of Behavioral Sciences at Austin P has created the Center for the Study of Military Life. The new center will support research activities to develop a more in-depth understanding of all aspects of military life affecting service members, military families, and their communities. Now closer to home at Tennessee State University, Tennessee State University graduate students want to learn if water-based aquatics can be effective in reducing seniors' risk of falls. A graduate student in the Department of Physical Therapy's doctoral program said, and I quote, it's all about balance and fall prevention. At the end of the study, students hope to publish their findings and present them at a meeting of the Tennessee Physical Therapy Association. And recently at TSU, TSU released an economic impact statement highlighting its many benefits to the state of Tennessee from its graduates and technology and research and more. The university contributes $610 million to the national economy through direct and indirect spending. In 2010-2011, TSU employed an average of 3,700 full-time, part-time, and temporary employees including faculty and students. Uh, that created $190 million 
in labor income and generated a total employment impact of $394 million. Now, as you can see from the handout, we have many things going on still in the Middle Tennessee area at Middle Tennessee State University. However, I'd like to take liberty to highlight two very recent exciting initiatives at MTSU. Just a few weeks ago, for those of you outside of the Middle Tennessee area, you may not have seen this major article in the March 14th edition of the Tennessean. Uh, there was a feature story about a newly created, the title of this is MTSU wants, the sip, wants a sip of herbal tea benefits, university Chinese team venture to unlock the secrets of plants to develop pills. This center, this Tennessee Research Center, is in partnership with the very prestigious university, Guanxi Medical University, and the Guanxi Botanical Garden of Medicinal Plants in Guanxi, China. It has the largest collection of medicinal plants in the world, and we are the first and the only university to have signed an exclusive agreement to conduct research in this area. The research center focuses on the isolation and characterization of active ingredients from various botanical extracts used in Chinese herbal medicine for the development of new pharmaceutical drugs. The application of herbal medicine for the treatment of a variety of diseases is an ancient and respected tradition in China. And while generally accepted in the Far East, it is becoming very popular in Western culture as well. New drugs that are developed as a result of activities in this research center will lead to the creation of intellectual property that will financially benefit MTSU and the state of Tennessee by potentially attracting pharmaceutical R&D companies to this state. I can't tell you the excitement that we've received from many of the private companies already about the research. We have received 50 abstracts that have been transported from China, and they're showing some interesting results in treating cancer, diabetes, and other types of diseases. And just this past Monday, I returned from, I returned from a very successful trip from Bangkok, Thailand. Yes, Bangkok. Currently, there are over 500 Thai alumni living in the Bangkok area. And on this past Sunday evening, in the middle of Bangkok, we launched the first international MTSU Alumni Association. And ladies and gentlemen, there were over 200 alums that showed up for that event as part of our 100th anniversary celebration. And during that reception, I was pleased to meet many of our successful Thai alum. MTSU apparently was the hub for enrollment. The government sent a lot of Thai students to our campus in the 70s and the 80s. And President Sunday was the Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand, who was an MTSU graduate and his wife. Also among our distinguished alums are five current and former governors of provinces in Thailand, and one of the well-known actors, Thai actor, I think I pronounced his name right, Shalit. He is famous. He's like the Denzel Washington of Thai. And several other very distinguished. It really was amazing to see the energy. Uh, some of these folks had not uh, been together in 30 years. Uh, over 200 of, of them showed up uh, to initiate and establish this uh, new national, International Alumni Association, the first. This is only the beginning of a new focus of the university to cultivate our alumni abroad who may have the potential to financially support their alma mater. Now moving to the east part of the state, at Tennessee Technological University, our tech engineering students have modified some common everyday items to give children and adults with disabilities the means to exercise, eat, study, and work. The projects are part of TTU's Early Intervention in Mechanical Engineering Program, which received 
the 2012 Partners and Leadership Award from the Tennessee's Public Health Association. Also, this past January, more than 170 people attended the Bullying Free Tennessee Conference coordinated by TTU students. I read this and I thought there are a few folks that I could recommend to attend this conference. Um, trying to make life a little bit easier for children in public, uh, in the public schools. And we know that's been a major, major issue, uh, not only in our state, but in our country, the whole issue of bullying. The conference included workshop guest speakers and updates on anti-bullying policies and legislation to encourage parents, educators, and students to work together to prevent bullying and to help children succeed, regardless of race, disability, social class, or sexual orientation. And finally, in the Far East region of our state, see, we have covered the entire state as the Board of Regents. At ETSU, the College of Pharmacy, class of 2011, recently made excellent scores on both the North American Pharmacist Licensure Exam and the Multi-State Pharmacy Jurisprudence Examination. Also at ETSU, two prof professors developed maps and graphs designed to help students with visual impairments to better understand geography. You see a theme? A lot of the research that's being done and a lot of the activities at our universities are not esoteric research. These are research and activities that are making a difference in the lives of the citizens of this state. Now, because of the reliance on maps, and then we know how crucial that is, a series of tactile maps were created that featured raised line images using texture rather than color to distinguish between regions, and they also added braille labels to the tactile maps. And finally, the magazine Pre-Med Life ranked the great metropolis of Johnson City, Tennessee, as one of the best cities in the United States to attend medical school. There was no surprises uh, at all, uh, Dr. Nolan, that Johnson City is a great city and a great institution. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my report for this quarter. Thank you for your indulgence. Uh, I think you are proud of all of our institutions, our technology centers, our community colleges, and clearly the four-year universities. We're doing some unbelievable things in this state that are really making a difference in the lives of the citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, President McPhee. Uh, are there any questions or comments for President McPhee regarding our the university report? Thanks again. Next item is unfinished business, and according to the records, there is no unfinished business to come before uh, the body as such. We would then move into uh, new business. Uh, first item on uh, the new, under new business is our consent agenda. And Regents, you have received copies of material that is presented under today's consent agenda. Today, uh, we will have the opportunity to ratify all items that are on the consent agenda uh, without discussion. If any member wants to discuss a particular item, you may ask that that item is withdrawn from the consent agenda. And at this time, I would ask fellow regents, is there any item on the consent agenda that anyone wants to have removed? Hearing none, let me uh, list the items for the record that will be uh, approved. Uh, one is the proposed program terminations modifications and new technical program implementations for the Tennessee Technology Centers. Uh, second item is revisions to TBR policy 4.02.20.00, which is the disposal of surplus personal property. Three is the revisions to TBR policy 3.02.00.01, general regulations on student conduct and disciplinary sanctions. Uh, 
four is revisions to TDR policy 1.07.00.00. Which is general policy on tobacco and, and alcohol beverages. Five is revisions to TBR policy 2.0100.03, principles for articulation in vocational and technical education. Uh, six is Nashville State Community College out of state tuition waiver request. Uh, is there a motion to approve? the consent agenda. It's moved by Regent Reynolds. Second. Second by uh, Governor Haslam. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposes the same. Next item is uh, new business. Uh, here I will note uh, uh, that the order of the information that is shown on the agenda uh, is uh, will be presented slightly different. Uh, we will first have a report from Vice Chancellor Wendy Thompson, uh, then Vice Chancellor Dale Sims, uh, followed by the final report from Vice Chancellor David Gregory. And it's at this time that we will get into some of the issues that you had raised, uh, uh, Regent Griskin. Uh, Vice Chancellor Thompson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Governor Haslam, Vice Chancellor Duckett, Regents, Chancellor, colleagues. At the last quarterly meeting, we talked a little bit about the completion agenda and the fact that there are a lot of initiatives related to completion going on out there. This slide should be familiar to you. We went over it at the last meeting. And what we tried to capture here is the fact that although there are lots of initiatives out there, our task is to filter those down to specific completion objectives for the Tennessee Board of Regents system. Again, you've seen this slide before. We talked a little bit about the work of the CDU, the Completion Delivery Unit, being primary, primarily to keep bringing the conversation back to these five key questions. What is our overarching goal? Where are we now? Where will we be tomorrow, next year? Are we on target? And if not, how will we adjust? Today I want to focus in on the work that the CDU has been doing since the last meeting to assist you and the Chancellor and other goal leaders in isolating the answer to the first and most critical question. What is our, the TBR system's, overarching goal? As background, you may recall that at the last meeting I asked you to work a little bit and I asked you two questions. The first was, what do you think is the goal of the completion agenda? And second, how will we know when we are successful? And your answers were pretty consistent. The goal is to have more students graduate and we'll know we're successful when more students graduate. Now, those are good answers, but we can't stop there because the answers, in fact, beg more questions. Is one more graduate enough? Are 300 enough? 3,000? And by when? Will it be the end of the year, by 2015, by 2020, or by 2025? So, since the last meeting, the CDU has been working to fine-tune the questions and the answers so that we can be precise in articulating the TBR goal and to make sure we can measure our success. In doing this, we asked, what is the TBR completion goal for 2025? The first step in making that determination was an acknowledgement of the guiding plans that already exist. Through the process of developing the TBR strategic plan that was led by Dr. Short and that many of you participated in, priorities, goals, and objectives were set for every credential level in the system. TTC certificates, TTC diplomas, community college certificates, associates, bachelors, masters, doctorates, and professional degrees. Subsequent to the adoption of the TBR strategic plan, the THEC public agenda was adopted to address the Complete College Act goal of bringing Tennessee to the national average for associates and bachelor's degrees by 2025. 
TBR numerical goals for associates and bachelor's degrees were included in the public agenda. Using work done in those two documents, the next step was to work with the chancellor to determine where the focus should be for the TBR 2025 completion agenda. For what will we be held accountable? The decision was to have a narrowly focused agenda that would do the following. One, include all segments of the system, including the TTCs. Two, address workforce preparation issues. And three, be consistent with the goals set out in the public agenda. So we answered the first question, what is the 2025 completion agenda for TBR? And the answer is, the 2025 completion agenda for TBR is to increase the number of TTC credentials, community college certificates, associates and bachelor's degrees awarded in the system by 2025. The next question, we needed to establish a 2025 goal for awards at each credential level to be able to answer the question, how will we know when we've been successful? To get at the answer, we started with what we knew. The public agenda had established goals for associates and bachelor's degrees, and so those goals were adopted as the TBR goals for those credentials. The public agenda did not address TTC credentials or community college certificates, so we needed to establish those goals. Using our strategic plan and the public agenda, we, we determined that approximately 3% annual growth would be needed to reach the public agenda goals, public agenda goals for associates and bachelor's degrees in 2025. After a series of discussions, we established a 3% annual growth goal for the remaining credentials as well. Using those assumptions, we established an overall TBR 2025 completion goal. The TBR completion goal is to go from a 2008-2009 baseline of 27,499 awards to 43,202 awards in 2025 for these disappearing, <laughs> back it up. Okay, for TTC certificates and diplomas, for community college certificates, and for associates and bachelor's degrees. For those credentials in 2025, we will make 43,202 awards. Reaching our goal will result in a cumulative increase of 116,823 awards over the baseline for this time period and a total credential production of 556,807 awards. It's really important to note here that our universities will continue the extremely important work of increasing degree attainment at the masters and above levels in accordance with our strategic plan. But for purposes of creating a focused and measurable agenda that helps us to monitor whether we're meeting the spirit and letter of the law of the Complete College Act, these are the measures we've set. So we have our overarching goal. The next step for the CDU is to work with goal leaders to determine how we can assist with identifying and tracking the success of campus and system strategies towards reaching the overall goal. Many of these strategies were designed through the strategic planning process and other processes designed to make a positive impact on student success and completion. Setting trajectories will help us know where we are on a regular basis. So now that we've determined our overarching goal, which is 43,202 awards in 2025, what you can expect is that at each quarterly board meeting, we will provide you with an update to answer the remaining questions. Where are we now? Where will we be tomorrow? Are we on target? If not, what we need to do to adjust. And that concludes my portion of the report. Okay. If I, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Please. And, and thank you very much, Wendy. It, it's, I think that helps us get a sense of, of 
of what those goals are and what they represent. And, and they represent a substantial improvement in, and there's the, the chart that we ha we're having a little bit of trouble with, but um, when you look at where we are compared to where we are committed to be in 2025, um, that's a 57, 58 percent increase in credentials on an annual basis that we'll be producing in 2025 over what we're doing right now. I mean, that's huge. Just the 2015 goal that coincides with our strategic plan um, represents a 16 to 17 percent increase in credentials over a fairly short period of time. So these are, <coughs> these are ambitious goals, um, but they're achievable, we believe. Um, but we think our interest for, as your staff, is to stay focused on this and to come back to you every quarter with a conversation about, as Wendy says, where are we now? Are we on track? And if we're not on track, we would expect you to be asking us questions about, well, what are y'all doing to try to get back on track uh, with, this, with these objectives? Um, so so the, the creation of the delivery unit was really about giving us the capacity for for a group that was outside of the delivery chain, I mean, not the folks who are responsible for doing the work, but the folks that would be responsible for helping us understand how that work is being accomplished. Are we succeeding in moving toward where the state needs for us to move as defined by the public agenda? And by the, that's very helpful. I appreciate that. Uh, is there a strategic plan behind this that talks about kind of the critical steps that need to happen, whether they be financial, organizational, et cetera, that, that the regents either have or could have? Well, I'm glad you asked that. If you have time to come back tomorrow from 10 to 12, <laughs> there will be, um, a, there's a group of goal leaders who will get together okay. to identify what strategies are already in place that will contribute or we expect to contribute yeah, are the to goal these. Leaders, who, are, who are they? In the system office, the goal leaders okay. are primarily the vice chancellors. Okay. Then we will work with the campuses to All establish right. goal leaders for campus strategies as well that we can monitor. I, was, I mean, one of the things that would be helpful, I think, for us as the state, it would be to know what are those things that you see as the biggest threats that, that would keep us from getting there uh, so that if we think through kind of vision and mission for higher ed and TBR's role in that, that we might say, well, from the folks who are actually doing it, here's what they're worried about in terms of what would stop us from having that kind of 57% growth. Absolutely, because this is just a trajectory that plots Got where it. we should be. But the next step is to recognize the challenges and opportunities that will either keep us on track or make us adjust to do something different. And that would help us everything from the financial piece to, uh, to everything else. That would be very helpful for us. And, and, do that. and Governor, each one of our institutions, and many of our, our president's institutional leaders are here today, um, has a strategic plan that uh, more or less and mostly more uh, aligns very closely with these goals for the system and with our system strategic plan, as, as Dr. Short had, had worked on that really in advance of the public agenda, but very closely aligned with and coordinated with the, the direction that the system was headed anyway. And, and, and that becomes the basis upon which the conversation each year with presidents about performance and how things are going is very much about where they are on their strategic plan that rolls up to where we need to be as a system uh, across our institution. So, and, and as far as threats and, and, and uh, kind of challenges, that, that uh, leads pretty, pretty well into the next part of the informational reporting from Vice Chancellor Sims, I think. Yes. Yeah. How are we doing with the numbers we're looking at right now? target numbers, you've got one for 2010, you got one for 2011. Are we on target? We are, we are on target towards our 2015 goals and our next report, we have asked the campuses to give us a progress report on where they are and so our next re report will include where we exactly fall on our trajectory. And so if, if we're off these numbers, are you asking them to come back so we have a chance to understand why we're not on those numbers, you know, what needs to be done? If yes. It's to some of the things the governor asked, are there, there are things out there that as we set this, as you all set this, 
that came into play that maybe we had not anticipated. Absolutely, right. If we if we go above on, in a year, we, we can explain that. If we if we look down the road and see that there's something happening either either financially or in in um, the business industry that will affect where we originally thought we would be, well, this process will help us to be able to explain that before it happens so that we can make adjustments where we need to. Can I just say again that these credentials are a part of this plan because they align with the Complete College uh, Tennessee Act, but there are additional credential uh, goals that exist within our strategic plan from masters and above. The work continues to go on for that, but for this purpose, these are the ones we're including. I would, I would like to, um, first of all, as a faculty member in the TVR system, when we look at these numbers, um, these are the students that we're all teaching. So when we, we try to say this is the projection, I'm looking at this as Betty and Susan and Antonio, and I am, from just coming from a faculty meeting on my campus, we're all grappling with how do we improve success and retention among our students. And one of the, the issues that we faced yesterday is that we are trying as faculty and as administrative support on the individual campuses, and I believe I can speak for everyone in this room who represents an institution, to do everything we possibly can, but sometimes we just have students as we try to move this number up who because of financial problems, it would be wonderful if we could have them all graduate and all be successful and retain them. But students don't have money to pay the gas to come to class. They don't have money for their books. So while we might try to separate this, and I appreciate that Vice Chancellor Sims is going to address the economic financial side, we can't separate these two. Um, if they cannot afford to come to pay the tuition to buy the books, they're not going to be able to be successful and graduate. So I, I, again, really want to stress that that is something that we all have to look at when we want these projections. And if I could, uh, Regent Weeks, you're, that, that's well stated um, and, and absolutely correct. Uh, and, and the other thing that I think will become more apparent as we move forward on this, on this process with this board as we move into the next quarter and the next year and so forth is is, uh, and, and Regent Griscom, to answer your question, we're going to blow through the 2015 goal. I think we're going to get there before 2015. I don't want to be too too bold, but but we're headed in that direction right now based on what I see happening in our system. But in order to get to these numbers, we have to be successful with students that historically we haven't been very successful with. And that includes underrepresented minorities. It includes low-income first-generation students and those are all and, and it's doable but it requires strategies and investments and capacity to be successful with those students um, and, and we're learning how I mean the how and that's what the completion Academy that was took place last year the one that is going to take place this next week is is helping us identify on a on a institution by institution basis, what are those things that appear to be useful strategies that could really work to, to change our success rates, to be more successful with students? Um, but it's going to take innovation and investment at the same time and addressing the needs of students for the economic needs of students as well as the economic needs of our institutions as well as the cultural needs of our students as well as the engagement aspects of, of success in higher education. All those things come together uh, in, in order for us to be successful, and, and, and that's what we're going to try to continue to, to focus on with you as we move forward is what are those strategies? Are they working? And if they're not, what are we going to give up and what are we going to now try to do in order to be more successful? Um, but, but to get to 43,000 credentials by 2025, um, that graduating class or those graduating classes in 2025 are going to look a lot different than the graduating classes uh, this year and last year and the, and, and the year before. I was just curious if there's an update briefly on community college branding. Yeah, uh, 
we, we can do that. Uh, either Vice Chancellor Nichols or Monica Greppen, our, our Director of Communication, either one. Um, it, it, the short story is um, we're in the throes of, of moving forward. I mean, there's, there's uh, meetings that have taken place. There's work that's been done by Level Communications. There's focus groups that are being uh, really done now about kind of what it, what it feels like, what it looks like, what it ought to be, what's going to be most effective. So we're very much in that process. Yeah, just very briefly, we've been uh, we've done a, conducted a lot of research. We visited our campuses. We've met with all of the presidents and marketing professionals on all of the campuses. Collected a lot of background information. We've also um, begun. We selected a name for our system. Tennessee's Community Colleges is our system name. But right now, we're in the process of conducting focus groups in three different regions across the state at three different campuses. And just earlier this week, I was at Southwest Tennessee Community College where we conducted two focus groups, one with the faculty and staff who work directly with recruiting students, and then one with the students, a very diverse group of students ranging in age from 17 to 75 were in that focus group. So we were testing um, the concept, the essence of the brand that we're developing. We also tested some logos and some taglines with them. We have um, our next focus group scheduled for tomorrow at Volunteer State for Middle Tennessee. And then next Tuesday is going to be at Walter State. So, so when do you think we'll have a final recommendation or plan or we expect to be able to roll something out this fall because also at the same time that we're doing this with the branding and with the logo um, and the tagline selection, we're also in the development of a web portal that will provide a lot of information that is consistent across our entire community college system. Any other questions? If, actually, if uh, Warren Nichols, if I might add to that uh, about the website uh, that uh, Monica uh, and Matthew Gann are, are uh, taking the lead on for the community colleges. One of the great things about this uh, community college uh, website, system-wide website that we're going to have, is it's going to, among other things, it's going to direct people to the programs that our, our colleges currently are offering and will, both on the academic side and on the uh, business economic workforce development side. Uh, uh, beginning with this new website, any person in or out of the state will be able to go to this college website, uh, Tennessee College website, and identify, I am looking for a program in. I'm looking for workforce occupations in. I'm looking for uh, training for my employers or employees in. And we'll be able to click on that, and it'll immediately direct that individual to uh, any of our 13 colleges that are currently offering those type of programs. So that no longer will a, stu a person have to hunt and peck 13 different sites to try to find out what we have to offer, where workforce education, where uh, workforce training, uh, you know, can, can be found within our community colleges. So we're, we're, uh, we're working very, very hard on that region and uh, you, you should see something uh, uh, fairly soon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Vice, Vice Chancellor. I, I just wanted to share, um, Lori, last night I was interviewing some seniors uh, graduating uh, from schools in Hamilton County, um, and uh, I was really impressed. Many had very high uh, GPAs, but their ACT scores didn't keep up with what we expect of incoming freshmen. Uh, I applaud the research we're doing and I hope, Paula, that we'll be able, and, and Dr. Huffman, incorporate uh, these sort of items in, in the research. Uh, many of these students will be first time from their family to go to college. And I was really excited about that. They had goals, and they're, they're involved in the community and on campus. But the challenges that they face, and, and I think uh, in order to, I'm not worried about our retention rate of those there. I think uh, that the research, such as some of the articles I looked over in here, will help with that. But uh, I think the challenge is helping them get into college, afford college, uh, and raise those uh, college ACT, SAT scores, 
uh, that'll help ensure that they'll uh, be able to, uh, once they're in there, to retain them, that they'll be able to graduate within the time frame we've laid out. So it seems to me there'll have to be a very close collaboration between us and, and uh, uh, K through 12 to make sure that the students are there. Many of them are from single parent families and, and uh, coming from a family, those that are first time considering going to college, many of them would hear that, oh, you can't do that and you can't, but these kids were really determined. Uh, they've all been accepted at colleges and any help and encouragement and, and a mentor, we can get them when they get here to help them through that first, second year in that transition from uh, to college, I think will help us reach our goal. And I completely agree, and, and when I look at these numbers, Part of what it makes me think is that, you know, part of your strategy for how to get there has to be um, the ACT goals and the build-up goals at every step along the way. Our projected rate of improvement is pretty similar to this. So we're attempting to grow the percentage of kids on grade level by 3 to 5 percent a year. Now, it's a lag. Um, um, because, of course, the kids who are sophomores, juniors, seniors right now are already a year behind where they should be. And um, so this plays out over time. You look at the class of 2024 for bachelor's degrees, and they must be in second or third grade right now. And so the work that we're doing right now ultimately impacts um, those numbers. But I think there's going to have to be an iterative process on the goal side. I think part of the strategic plan needs to be understanding what we're projecting in terms of high school um, uh, and ACT scores, but I completely agree. One of the big challenges that the TBR system faces right now is that the kids that are coming out of K-12 aren't ready for college. No. So, um, and, and you talk about the kids who are excited about it. On the ACT, more than three-quarters of the kids who take the ACT say that they aspire to get a four-year college degree. And then they take the test, and 15% of them are college-ready across all four of the major subject areas. So that's obviously a very significant problem. Our kids want to go to college. We're not equipping them with the skills to succeed. So that's a problem that we're grappling with and um, I think we'll make headway on, but it's going to take a little bit of time and I'm looking forward to taking some of this data and using it to inform some of our ACT goals. Um, I, I would also, I also wonder, Chancellor, if there are goals or will be goals around um, uh, completion percentage and dropout rates because one of the things I think that I'm concerned about is, um, you know, that child who really wants to go, isn't prepared, goes, takes on debt, and comes away with nothing to show for it. And I think as we strive to, um, to grow these numbers, we also need to strive to make sure that the percentage of kids completing goes up. Because the outcome-based formula that um, becomes integral to our ability or, or one of the tools that we believe is integral to our ability to meet to meet our needs very much takes into consideration those elements um, uh, and 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 that becomes uh, a measurement as we'll talk about in just a minute that that will support this whole idea of where are we how are we doing we'll be able to talk about how we're doing in some very discrete areas that align with the outcome based formula that help get us to to these goals one last part I'd like to add is that uh, higher ed is continually raising the goal when you look at admission requirements, but unfortunately the kids, the seniors in K through 12 aren't able to keep up. So that, that delta, that gap between college preparedness, ACT scores, and then higher 
admission rates is, is, is growing, the gap. And so it seems like there needs to be a goal and a strategy to narrow that gap. And I think that's what Kevin was saying. That, that's what we see as our primary mission there. Great. Yep. I just want to add one other thing. As we look at this, and based on what the commissioner said, it'd be interesting to see progress being made on how many students are coming out that are now prepared so that remediation number goes down. I'd like to see that because we've talked before in here about how first to the top and complete college are linked together. And unfortunately, I think when we started, they were sort of looked like two different entities, but they're not. And as we've heard here, they have to be linked. But to me, if we see that remediation number is going down, then that's saying Commissioner, I think that what you're doing in K to 12 is getting them better prepared, and then and it all we ought to see it reflected here as we go forward. I do have one more statement yes. about that. Until that remediation gap is closed, we at the college, whatever uh, higher ed level, are having to deal with those students who are coming in who do need remediation. And one of the things that I really do want to applaud is the academy that. I know my institution went to the academy at, in the first session because that was where we had a collaborative effort from all of the schools who were in attendance to look at the strategies we can use, embedded remediation, so that those students that you've talked to do not come into school and face two years of remedial and developmental classes, but rather we're looking at some innovative strategies above and beyond the ACT as the sole assessment to say what can we do to keep those students encouraged to make those students go through to completion and to, to be successful. So there is a lot going on that's not necessarily in the reports that are given by the presidents, but there is a lot going on on an instructional level within the TBR schools about grappling with these issues, these issues of diversity and underprepared students. So I think if we all hear a little bit more about that, and again, I mentioned at one of our other meetings, those board members who could attend or who could see what's happening at these academies, we need that sort of endorsement and support. You, you need to see what's going on from these institutions on the front lines. I think that makes a difference. Ex excellent comments that have been made, uh, which lends itself to a great segue to Vice Chancellor Sims uh, update or continuation uh, as it relates to the uh, overview of the, the budget. Uh, good afternoon, Governor, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, great segue. We have t been talking about a big goal, a big goal. That's what uh, Vice Chancellor Thompson has talked to you about. My role is to get a little more granular. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have as many answers as I have questions. I think that that is part of the role, uh, part of what we think the board uh, is asking for, and that is, as a board, uh, what can we look at? What information do we need to see where the momentum is? Are we making progress? Uh, where we're making progress, why? Where we're not making progress, why? Uh, today's presentation, uh, my part of this is to try to link the, the outcome formula outcomes to our funding situation uh, it's the next iteration we had a discussion of this at our chairs meeting this is the next iteration of that we'll start off with kind of the 10,000 foot viewpoint of the new outcomes formula uh, these are the outcomes and just as a reminder each of these outcomes is measured on a three-year moving average uh, the importance of this table being in front of you is not really a discussion about any of these individual items but it's more about what this formula, what these outcomes tell our institutions and tell our system. Essentially, it says, as state government, higher education commission, through their formula development, said, these are the things that are priorities for our state to advance. We need higher education to perform in these areas. Uh, an oversimplification stated in reverse on this is, if there is an activity that is not listed here, the state is unwilling to commit resources to allocate resources for that activity. So things on these charts such as retention measures, graduation, uh, degrees granted, uh, uh, our remedial and developmental success, those are things that the state says we're willing to allocate resources for. If it's not on this table, it doesn't enter into our funding picture. Uh, outcomes, 
one of the primary inputs to the higher ed formula. Uh, there are a series of others, physical space, the square footage we occupy, our equipment inventory, performance scores. Uh, this is a traditional, uh, I think, 20-year program in Tennessee in terms of judging the quality of outcomes, uh, things such as job placement rates, licensure pass, pass rates, et cetera. And then a major driver is the SREB average salary. Uh, question then comes at a high level, what happens? You gather all this information, what, what happens next? You'll be relieved to know I'm not going to go through all these steps. Um, but these are essentially a sampling of the calculations that are contained within the funding formula that take these raw outcomes and drive toward a bottom line number. Uh, examples include, uh, one of my favorites is the very first one, outcomes earned or awarded on behalf of low income and adult learners earn a 40% premium. So there's a premium placed on continuing to engage low income students and adult learners. Uh, another one of my favorites, weighting. We weight these outcomes differently. Uh, the research effort at Austin P State is not the same weight as it is at the University of Memphis. It recognizes institutional distinctiveness, the same at our community colleges. Uh, when you look at this then, and again, trying to get this to kind of a 10,000 foot level, when you work through all this, and as a board member, what is it you're trying to, what question are you trying to ask? I mean, or what, what is it we're driving at? Question that at least we're trying to identify for you to respond to is, what can a board member focus on to judge how funding of our institutions is likely to change going forward? And what is our momentum? Is the momentum positive or is it negative? There are a couple of questions that I think are key to answering that. I mean, what should we be looking at? First is, you ought to look at whatever counts. You ought to look at what's important. When you look at our formula, you can break it into that outcome result, space and equipment kind of fixed cost and performance score. When you look at how much those drive our funding, clearly the outcomes drive the majority of it. 80% plus of what an institution receives in terms of the funding formula is driven by the outcomes they produce. So lesson one is focus on outcomes. Second is, well, can inst institutions influence that? And I think that the formula, the basic premise of the formula is institutions through their activities can influence the, the production of outcomes, the achievement of outcomes. So that's the second thing that I think an affirmative answer, both those things uh, are important. Next page, what does that lead you to think? What are the takeaways? Again, outcomes are the primary driver. Uh, they can be influenced by institutional action. The second thing is there's a lot of noise in the formula. We go through a number of calculations, but regardless of those other calculations, annual improvement in raw outcomes is always a positive. It's always good when you produce more outcomes. As a caveat there, if you're producing outcomes at a greater rate that are heavily weighted for your institutions, it's even better. That's the home run. Uh, so the suggestion from your staff is you ought to focus on outcomes. As a board member, you ought to be interested in the outcomes that our institutions are producing. Uh, we're now going to move into a discussion of outcomes, and this is the, the chart piece that I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as I enjoyed putting them together. Uh, before we get into it, I need to say the data behind this is data that was used by the Higher Education Commission to produce the formula. So it's, it's information that's been vetted through the Higher Education Commission. Unless I mention it otherwise, there's four years worth of information here. Uh, the information is raw data. It's not been weighted. It's not been smoothed in any manner. Uh, there are some anomalies, I need, and we'll touch on those as we move through here. Uh, there are definition changes that are occurring between the historic information and, and information moving forward. So that gets kind of a, creates a little noise that over time will, will work its way through. Uh, and don't try to think that there's any sort of message being given by grouping of outcomes by chart. Uh, it's solely, they're, they're grouped on these charts solely to give you kind of a common scale so trends are more apparent. Uh, need to also say that th this information is available on an institution by institution basis and if it serves the board's purposes, uh, the information that follows can be produced discreetly for each and every institution in the system. With that, We'll move on to the first chart, and uh, 
I mentioned to you, every chart's set up the same. They all look the same. The only real difference in the charts is the scale on the left-hand side, essentially the raw number production. The yellow lines are always a trend line. Uh, just a few comments on this one. Uh, these are at our universities. It combines all the results for all the universities. So it's a combined number. Uh, the, uh, the trend lines on these, they are basically retention measures and bachelor's and associate's degrees. Uh, trend lines are all positive. I think echoing what the chancellor has said about his belief that we will meet the 2015 goal. Uh, in terms of the trends, they look very positive. Uh, as you might imagine, a little bit of volatility year to year. Uh, and Y'all will have to stop me. Feel free to stop me, but I'm going to kind of roll through this as, as, uh, as expeditious as I can. The next chart really focuses the top bar or the top uh, lines are masters and educational specialists, essentially uh, masters level work uh, where you see again volatility, but the, the uh, trend is positive. The bottom line uh, is one that you might ask a question about. It is transfers out of our institutions in good academic standing after 12 hours of work. Uh, it is a, it's a, uh, an element in the formula little bit volatile, but the slope is, is clearly down. Uh, a couple of comments I'll make on that. I'm not convinced that as a matter of the formula that a downward slope on this one is a bad thing. If you're retaining more students, that probably drives this number lower. Uh, the original thought in including it in the formula, and this is my take on it, not necessarily what THEC may say, but I think that the original intent was to recognize that institutions have to put forth effort to get a person to at least 12 hours plus in good academic standing. The fact that a student, because of a change of financial situation, has to move from a residential uh, institution to one closer to home where they can commute uh, for a variety of reasons, for family situations, they, they have to relocate. Uh, it was viewed as a penalty to institutions if that was not recognized in some manner. This was the metric that was chosen. I think, as, again, as the formula evolves, that, uh, that reviewing this over time, seeing what, in, what uh, um, activity it incents would be appropriate. Again, uh, just to, to sum that one up, on that one, negative slope, headed down, could be read as a positive thing. Uh, but certainly not something that we're encouraging our institutions to do in terms of get someone to 12 hours in good academic standing and then send them to Florida or to a private institution. Uh, the next page, uh, the top one, doctoral law degrees. Again, low volatility, but clearly an upward slope. Uh, the bottom line, and you can't hardly see because the trend line and the, the actual production is right on top of one another, uh, the bottom line is our research and service uh, expenditures. Now, this metric is based on externally funded research and service activity. So this isn't about reallocation of internal resources. It is about actually reaching out into the community and gaining dollars from external sources. Again, the good news is that's a positive slope. Uh, essentially, as a system, we move from about $140 million of annual activity to over $170 million. Next chart. Uh, the top line is, uh, is our six-year cohort graduation rate. Little, again, a little volatility there. Uh, the slope is upward, uh, slightly upward. Uh, six-year graduation rates take, take a little bit of time to move, but the momentum is in the right direction. The bottom metric is degrees per 100 FTE, an alternate uh, pro productivity measure. Uh, I would say that that is probably a lagging indicator uh, our, our universities over this period of time saw an 11% increase in enrollment on an FTE basis. Since that is the denominator, uh, it takes a while to produce outcomes, to produce degrees. So it's probably one of those things that, that, uh, that we'll, we'll always see somewhat of a lag on. Uh, next chart, bar chart as opposed to line chart, and this is basically your uh, compound annual growth rates by uh, outcome. Uh, essentially looking at and saying over this four-year period of time, what was the annual growth rate in each of these outcomes? Uh, we have two that are negative at our universities. The first one transfers out. I've already talked about that. May or may not be a, 
a, a, a red flag waving kind of uh, outcome, may be a positive. And the others is, is degree per 100 FTE, discuss that about that may be a lagging item. Uh, both of those, though, deserve further discussion and further research to determine what drives those numbers and if my supposition on what drives them is correct. Other than that, you can see we're positive in every area. Research uh, clearly outstrips that spending, uh, outstrips it. I think that it's important that, uh, that we have uh, clearly positive trends in all of, our, uh, all of our retention measures. That will end up driving our award degrees. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Governor, that finishes the community college, the university piece. We now can move toward community colleges. Uh, again, different set of metrics, little different story in some respects. Uh, retention, this first chart focuses essentially on retentions. Um, Regent Weeks, I will note that the white line is our remedial and developmental success. There was a dip there, but uh, again, pretty phenomenal production or recovery in 2010-11 in terms of those results. The trend lines in all these areas are positive. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the note that says we ought to ask a question, are the retention measure at 12 hours and retention measure at 24 hours. Although 24 hours in the most recent year is down slightly, it's, pretty, it's down pretty materially in the 12-hour sector. Uh, Every instance of a student com successfully completing college level work started, after being involved okay. in remedial okay, development. Okay. Okay. That's a great question. Uh, the 12 hour measure, this is one of those data anomalies that I need to mention to you. We historically have measured this on a 14th day enrollment. Uh, we've moved to end of term enrollment. So I think this creates noise in the formula that will take some time to work through the formula. So I think that that, again, deserves more e exploration, but I think that that gives you a sense as to what may be driving that metric. Uh, the next chart, dual enrollment is the top line there, uh, growing substantially. Uh, our, our, our community colleges are really reaching out to, uh, to high school students in dual enrollment programs. Uh, I think that that is a, a, is a positive for the system and for the state. What it does, those students, wherever they enroll, they'll be taking college credit with them. It will accelerate their time to degree. So I think that this is a very positive trend for the state and in particular for our community colleges. Uh, you can see again that the transfers out is basically a flat line. My same caveat there, I'm not sure that that is a negative for institutions in terms of, of, uh, of a decrease there. And then the job placement, uh, job placements, uh, which has been a measure within performance funding for some number of years, is relatively flat. Again, don't really even have a, a, an idea of why that may be a, a, a flat number for that for the system. Next chart uh, is one of just a phenomenal picture. Certificates of less than a year. These are our certificates of less than 24 hours that are awarded by our community college system. It is a new measure in the formula that was just incorporated in for the fiscal 13 recommendations. You can see a good bit of growth there. Uh, the certificates of uh, one to two years, basically more than 24 hours, 24 hours or more, uh, there is, again, positive slope there. Uh, I should say, on the certificates of less than one year, TEC's agreement to accept those certificates was based upon uh, essentially the understanding that these certificates have value, economic value, so to speak, for the recipient. So uh, it, it, is, it is something that prepares that individual uh, for the workplace, for the workforce, as opposed to enrichment type activities. So those uh, don't read that to be that we're expanding out uh, cultural enrichment activities. Those are really designed to be certificates with an economic or market value. Uh, the next line chart is workforce training hours. Uh, again, the slope on this is phenomenal. Uh, just as grown by leaps and bounds that we, we started somewhere around 450,000 contact hours of training and we're up over almost, uh, well, we're over 700,000 uh, contact hours of training. Uh, the caveat on this one is up until this formula, uh, there was no financial incentive for institutions to produce these contact hours. 
essentially the system didn't gather these hours on a regular basis, there could be underreporting in early years on this, so that growth rate may be misleading. Uh, but it, still, it is a very positive story the way that it, uh, that it lies uh, before you today. Yes, sir. On in the economy, so that the, if you got workforce training, is it tied at all to people who maybe want to go back and get additional training? So that we ought to think that number may dip again if the economy picks up. Or do you have a feel for that? Uh, it's, first of all, it's a great question, and really haven't looked at it from that angle. But we, we do know just generally enrollment in higher education during economic times of economic stress increases. I would suspect that the same is true here, okay. but it can't answer that definitively. Okay. Showing you the kind of the raw data over four years for the actual use in the outcome based formula, there are three year moving averages, so you'll get some smoothing of, of that uh, economic impact that, that may occur in a, uh, over a short term uh, basis. Uh, the next chart uh, is our awards per 100 FTE, again, downward slope on that. Uh, same sort of note there in terms of uh, community colleges over this period of time, increase in enrollment was over 20% or right at 20%. So that drives, all things else being equal, that would drive this number lower. Um, as you've noted, the, the, the uh, production of associate's degrees and certificates increased during the period of time. So it's probably a phenomenon of, of lagging, uh, a lagging performance indicator as much as anything else. Uh, the next, we look at bar charts, again, for the community college system. Uh, 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 these are each of the metrics. Uh, you'll see, again, we have two that are negative. Job placements, just slightly negative in terms of a compound annual growth rate and awards per 100 FTE slight, are negative by about 8%. Uh, again, questions as to what's going on there, uh, what, what, what plans, if any, are appropriate in order to address that. Uh, overall, though, uh, all the metrics are up uh, uh, over the period of time in terms of an annual growth rate, particularly that certificates of less than a year. Mr. Vice Chair, the next thing that we'll do then is take a look at weighted outcomes. Uh, <coughs> I told you, first of all, to ignore all the noise in the formula, the weighting and all that, and now I'm going to bring you back to weighting because ultimately what the institution's uh, 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 allocation of state funds is based on has a lot to do with institutional weights. Uh, how do we take these raw outcomes? We average them over three years and then we weight them and what does that produce in terms of total outcomes for an institution? Uh, the, the first chart that we'll look at, this is for our universities. Uh, it is a comparison of the weight, total weighted outcomes in 2012 to the outcomes in 2013. The green bar represents the absolute weighted outcomes in 2012. The yellow piece is that growth in outcomes in 2013, and then the percentages are what is that growth rate in total weighted outcomes. Uh, all of our universities saw increases in their weighted outcomes, uh, primarily because uh, virtually all of them saw increases in every metric uh, between the two-year period of time. Uh, the one exception is, uh, is Tennessee State. Uh, you know, 1.1% decrease, uh, that is because their total weighted outcomes fell by 14. So kind of the sensitivity to the formula to weighted outcomes is illustrated there in some respects. Uh, primary drivers of that reduced uh, outcome uh, production. Uh, retention measures, they were down across the board on retention measures and on degree production. In some respects, I think that is a reflection of a significant decrease in their enrollment in the 2006 to 2008 period of time, sort of the period of time when students would, be, would have been enrolling and moving through the institution to arrive at successful outcomes. So that has some impact on it. Again, in the, in the vein of this being a why document, it's more of identifying what questions should we ask. One thing, Dale, if I could, what we, the good news is for TSU is this past fall they had an increase, in fact, maybe an increase in enrollment that was maybe better than any of our other universities. So, so we hope that to the extent that this is the downward trend is explained by that dip in enrollment, that that, that trend becomes re, is reversible certainly, but, but becomes reversed based on their enrollment continuing to grow. 
Uh, good point. Uh, the next chart, uh, community colleges, again, since they're 13 versus 6, this one gets a little busier. Uh, but basically, we had positive growth at 11 of the 13. That growth ranged from three-tenths of a percent to almost 14 percent, so pretty substantial growth at, at most of our institutions. Uh, we did have decreased uh, total weighted outcomes at two. Uh, one, Nashville State, uh, driven almost exclusively by a, a significant reduction in workforce training hours reported. Uh, in discussion with the THEC staff, there was a reporting error in terms of their report of workforce training hours earlier, and this essentially is a data collect correction. Uh, so that is what primarily drove the result at, at Nashville State. Uh, uh, Southwest Tennessee Community College was down by uh, half a percent in terms of total weighted outcomes. That half a percent basically means their total weighted outcomes decreased by 4.5. Uh, really driven by a decrease in the number of certificates that were awarded and their workforce training hours again. Uh, most of the other indicators in terms of their three-year averages and their overall production uh, were, were positively sloped. Uh, so weighted, total weighted uh, outcomes is, is the primary driver for our funding recommendation. Well, how does that translate to money? That's really the next part of this. Uh, if you'll move forward one more, and this will be a table that I hope you have in front of you. It may be difficult to read otherwise. Um, for members that were here during the chair's meeting, I have revisited the alphabet and appropriately labeled each of the columns. It's an inside joke, maybe. Uh, just, just to walk through this, uh, the first column is a listing of our institutions. And for purposes of discussion, uh, I'm going to focus on that top group, our universities, and the next group, which is our community colleges. They're the ones that are, are primarily impacted by the outcome formula. Um, column A is the recurring budget for this year, or recurring is the total budget for this year. The noise in it is, is there's non-recurring money in it. So the first thing in terms of preparation of budget that, that the Commissioner of Finance and the Governor do is they, move, they pull those non-recurring dollars out. So you see that in column B. So that's the first adjustment you see. So when you get to column C, you're looking at the recurring money available to each institution uh, at this uh, for, uh, for 11 12. Uh, column D, uh, we were told late last, uh, last fall that we would see potentially a 5% funding reduction. We actually experienced a 2.1% funding reduction. All the red numbers in that column D represent that funding reduction. So you can see that that there's, uh, based upon the essentially the size of the institution, its current budget, those dollars will uh, will vary somewhat from a high of, a little, of almost $1.8 million to a couple of hundred thousand dollars at some of our community colleges. Column E is the one that uh, that I know is, is, uh, is challenging for some of our institutions and is almost a godsend for others. This is the, the essentially the, the column that accounts for the phase-in of the new formula and the phase-out of the Hold Harmless Agreement. So within our system, if there's a black number there, Austin P at the top, black number, million dollars, they are a winner in the new formula phase in in the removal of Hold Harmless. Uh, ETSU is one of the institutions that loses fun funding as part of the implementation of the formula in the Hold Harmless. The takeaway on column E is, is that this does not impact our institutions on an equal basis. There is some disparate, although they're being treated the same from the formula standpoint, the actual impact on institutions varies depending on where they've been historically. Uh, column F then gets you to a recurring number that is essentially our base number, our beginning number for the current year. Uh, column G is the one that I, I want to spend a minute, just a few minutes on. Uh, that is improvement funding or additional money that the governor has recommended. Uh, it totals for our formula for our academic units a little over $13 million, almost $14 million. That column is directly driven by the weighted outcomes that you've just looked at. Now you might ask why we have some institutions that had negative weighted outcomes or reduction. Why did they receive more money? The weighted outcomes are not the end of the calculation. There are things like 
uh, SREB average salary, space, if you've added space, uh, that impacts it. Your performance score impacts that ultimate funding. So there, there's other noise in there, but every institution within our system receives more money, and it's primarily based upon that growth in total weighted outcomes. Uh, column H, salary and benefits. Uh, the, uh, the governor proposed a 2.5% cost of living increase. That funding is built into our budget as well as the funding for other benefit increases. Uh, you end up with column J. Uh, I'll skip a little bit ahead there. Column J is the re recurring recommended budget for next year. So if the General Assembly adopts the budget as the governor has presented it, that would be our recurring number by our, for institutions. Well, how does that change from where we are in terms of recurring numbers in the current year? Uh, column K is a total there, and what that does, it looks at the salary and benefit numbers as well as the, perform the outcome funding numbers and the hold harmless removal, the phase in, all those things, rolls them together. And as you look down through that column, you'll see that, uh, that we only have one institution that next year would receive less recurring funding than they have in the current year. Uh, primarily because of the salary money. The, the, the last column, we essentially exclude the salary and benefits money. Uh, rationale for that, we have little discretion over that. We have some degree of discretion, but generally that money is given to us to fund benefit cost increases or to fund salary policy, and we traditionally follow those leads on those items. When you look at that column, we have eight institutions plus our TTCs that would receive less in recurring funding next year than they receive have received this year. The, the takeaway on that, uh, in part, is, is uh, virtually every institution on this list improved their weighted outcomes. If you look at the individual metrics, they were positive. Uh, but we will have eight institutions that, as a result of the the, the primarily the 2% budget reduction will receive less in funding next year than they did this year, which means that budget reduction activity uh, that they have engaged in for four years now, almost five years, they will have to engage in again since they will have fewer resources to continue uh, current operations. Um, Really sorry that, that the governor had to leave before we got to this slide because he, you know, he asked a question about what are the threats to our success um, and ability to meet those goals that we talked about earlier. Um, one of those threats is the lack of financial resources to make the investments necessary in the strategies that we know can work in order to improve our ability to be successful with those students that require higher touch kinds of, of, of interventions in order to be successful. So, so the, part of the point here is, is that when we think about what are those factors that could keep us from being successful, one is if we're in an environment where there's a continuing diminishment of resources that are available to make those kind of investments. So that even on a net basis, all but one institution has more money than they've had before coming from the state because much of those dollars will be dedicated to salary increases, they're not really available for strategic investments in things that, that make a difference in terms of student success. So, so that's, that's a point that, that we, since he invited us to, we'll make that point to him in different ways going forward. Um, but but, but that, that's why this becomes so critical. And over time, and, and our presidents are here, and they, they would, I'm sure would, would share this, over time, continued improvements in outcomes that result in, because of all the other things going on, reductions in state appropriations really undermines the, the whole point of the outcome-based formula and the positive incentives that it can create. So, so that's something that we're, we're grappling with and we'll continue to talk about over time. It is important to understand we're talking about state dollars on this chart. Um, we're not talking about student fee dollars and you know we'll have that conversation between now and, and the board meeting in June. Uh, so but, but based on state funding this is kind of where where we where we are. I just have one comment and you and I have had this exchange in some emails and discussions. 
I know that when we look at the column E, the formula phase out and the hold harmless, that it does tend to make us be sympathetic for those schools that are now in red. But I also want to um, remind everyone that that was an adjustment in um, maybe, I'm not sure how to put it for everybody, but it is now an equal playing field. Um, and, and so I think while those schools are taking a hit with the hold harmless mm -hmm. having to come out, it, mm -hmm. it is now a little bit more of a recognition of schools getting appropriations and getting funding for what they're yeah. actually producing. Yeah. And, and that's a, that is accurate. It's uh, depending on where you set, it determines where you stand on the removal of the hold harmless and the new formula phase in. But clearly, over a prolonged period of time, certain institutions benefited from the hold harmless, while others did not. And uh, I guess my, my concern is, is this adjustment period is not occurring over a five or ten year period of time. It's occurring over a relatively short period of time on the heels of 25% funding reduction generally but but that is almost a conversation that uh, if Dr. Goff is here he will shoot arrows at me but that is a conversation that is pri that is mostly, I think, <laughs> mostly I think mostly I think people understand where we are and we are moving through that so uh, Uh, when I look at those that lost base and, and that maybe didn't meet their outcomes, it raises for me the question with universities, community colleges, and certificates, technology centers, the question being, uh, are we effective in helping students determine the best entry point to ensure their success? Uh, and, you know, we talked to while back about ACT scores and that sort of thing, but is there an assessment that determines whether a university or a community college are based on the student's aptitude and academic record, a technology center? Uh, the bottom line being, how do we get them in the program that best ensures their success rather than additional remediation? Well, if, if I could, Major Ray, I'll take a shot at that. Others in the room may have, have better answers, but <clears throat> that is the kind of conversation that we hope um, goes on in high school uh, guidance uh, sessions with, that high school students, as they move through the system, have the opportunity to explore what it is that, that best suits um, their circumstance and you know, what they want to do, but also what they seem to be best prepared to do. Um, but, but looking at our institutions, because of the outcome formula and the things that, that Dale just went over, you know, we have a lot of incentive in our institutions to try to make sure that the students that we are recruiting in, the students that come to our institutions, are in a position to be as successful as they can be. Those that aren't, we have you know, there are significant efforts that are undergoing, you know, being undertaken to help them get to where they can, can be successful. But for our institutions, it, it doesn't help for our universities to enroll a bunch of folks who ought not be there and could better be, uh, have better chance of success at other institutions. Same is true for community colleges and technology centers for that matter. Um, so, so we all have, I think, pretty strong incentives to uh, try to do the best we can at uh, uh, getting students in, in a position and as quickly as possible prepared to be successful. Because if we don't, um, the, the trend lines will not be positive and the, uh, the institutional result will be uh, very detrimental. You know, though, John, the other incentive is from a financial standpoint for the student that if they enter at uh, a university level, the cost is higher, there's less uh, scholarship available through the loan lottery program. Uh, 4,000 versus 2,000, and although the credits hopefully are transferable, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've worked that out, but the incentive is for them to, to enter at the place where they can be successful. Mr. Vice Chair, I have two or three other slides, but it, we can work through them pretty quickly uh, because they are just graphic presentations of the table. Uh, basically, each of these is set up the same way. This is showing you for universities, community <laughs> colleges, and technology centers. 
uh, the change in their state appropriation level with and without the salary and benefits number included. The blue bar is with, the green bars are without, so you can see that, that uh, as as a group, uh, the universities uh, about break even, lose a little bit of money. Uh, community colleges are about $800,000 ahead and technology centers are down about $50,000. We then take another granular look at it. Um, next slide is our universities individually and you'll see again more dispersion there of the effect of it and again primarily driven by the uh, phase in phase out of the, of the new formula. And then the last chart is uh, the community college uh, system individual action there again blue bar includes salary and benefit green bar excludes salary and benefit with that in wrapping this up uh, the I think the primary purpose there are probably several purposes in this presentation today but one purpose was to find out from the board as to whether this is headed in the direction in terms of a reporting mechanism a tool for you Again, to go back and where I began, understand where the momentum is. Are we headed in the right direction? Uh, does this give you a feel for where our funding may be headed going forward? Uh, we are, what we're attempting to do is come together with, with a reporting protocol around the formula that is more valuable to you than just throwing a bunch of numbers on a screen and saying this is the formula result. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd be glad to try to respond to any additional questions members have. Okay. Any regions have any additional questions? If not, that was a lot of information. And if I could have a point that. of personal privilege, yes, sir. Uh, Pat Massey uh, actually works with me on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, I need to say that I think that the reason that it doesn't appear she's got 45 years of service is the benefit of working with an easygoing guy. <laughs> uh, no, Pat. Pat is a consummate professional. <laughs> Pat is a consummate professional, and I do appreciate, uh, appreciate her assistance every day. Uh, Pat, uh, the mistakes that I make are usually when I fail to follow uh, Pat's counsel. So I, I wanted to say, Pat, I do appreciate my, my three-plus years with you, and uh, I selfishly hope that there are several more years left to, to come. I think we all uh, share those sentiments. and. Uh, at the risk of HR stepping in, I thought you were going to say uh, tolerates you, <laughs> uh, but uh, we all admire and appreciate Pat's uh, contributions to the organization. Uh, the next item is uh, Vice Chancellor Gregory. Where have you escaped? Oh, there you are. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, sure. Chancellor, Regents. The reason why Pat has 45 years is because working with Dale's like dog years. She's really only worked with us about six years or seven years. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good afternoon. I'm going to uh, give you a, a brief legislative update um, just to sort of let you know. Um, legislature is intent upon trying to adjourn its uh, session somewhere at the end of April. And... Uh, the legislature is in its second year of its General Assembly, so bills that are introduced last year held over this year, bills that are introduced this year uh, will terminate when the legislature adjourns sine die. Um, it is at that phase of the General Assembly where the governor has introduced his budget. The budget hearings from the agencies have been conducted. Uh, committees have um, engaged the work of the uh, individual bills and are now attempting to uh, finish up uh, the committee work such that the last month can sort of be dedicated to um, looking at the governor's uh, uh, proposed budget and any adjustments that might be made. I would say it looks at this stage to be a fairly orderly uh, ability to uh, make it through the governor's uh, proposed budget. I think that's good news for us relative to the capital outlay programs that have been um, uh, recognized in the governor's budget. and. Um, the uh, the salary dollars and other type of things that will uh, help our institutions going forward. If I might just take you through some of the pieces of legislation that I've reported on uh, previously, the first uh, three or four slides will relate to uh, some of the larger issues that impact uh, the regents, and then the last slides will be the bills that uh, you approve for the regents to uh, 
um, as, our, as a part of our legislative agenda back at your, your December meeting. First bill has to do with student safety. It's the guns uh, issue, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to report uh, some um, not so good news on, on this front. The two bills that you see um, on the screens in front of you, Senate Bill 3002 and Senate Bill 2292 by Senator Falk and Representative Bass, those are the two bills that um, um, would allow uh, people to take their weapons and, and bring it on to uh, private property, uh, provided that they keep their weapon locked in their um, trunk or in their glove box. Um, this is, uh, uh, we're in the midst of a, of a very interesting uh, discussion and debate about people who believe very strongly in the Second Amendment rights to bear arms and also people who very much strongly believe in the uh, right of private property holders. But in both of these bills, uh, it would allow for uh, guns to come on to our campus in the manner uh, for which I described. The bad news is that the bills had been sort of held in the committee and just this past week, um, the Senate committees approved the, uh, both of these bills and are now headed to the calendar committee um, uh, in the Senate. Um, I'm very appreciative to Monica Greppen on our staff and all of the communications uh, folks across our system, our presidents. Um, I particularly just want to say a special thanks to Dr. Goff, Gary Goff at um, uh, Rowan State. If you have not read his editorial that is in the Knoxville News Sentinel, um, you should do that. Uh, it's a very thoughtful article about uh, student safety, and that's really where we're uh, where we come out on this. So we have more work to do to try to continue to uh, oppose these two measures. The next bill um, is um, the next series of bills uh, relates to bills that were introduced earlier to limit our uh, this board's ability to uh, uh, set tuition limits. Um, it appears that all three of these bills that you see in front of you uh, will not pass the legislature this year. Um, Last night, Representative Reagan on uh, item number one there um, uh, asked to address the uh, Education Committee, expressed his concern about continuing rises in tuition and took that bill off notice. So it does not appear that um, the tuition limitation bills will uh, uh, gain approval for this year. The next series of bills relate to the lottery changes, and I've, I've spoken with you about this before, and I want to try to be as concise with somewhat of a confusing measure as I can. Um, Senate Bill 2514 was or is a byproduct of a summer study that looked at how do we get the lottery on a, on a balanced budget basis on going forward. And during the midst of this discussion, the lottery proceeds improved. And so it, it puts some moving parts uh, into this bill that is likely to pass, and I will try to describe this for you if I can. In the fall of fiscal year 2015-16, if the lottery proceeds have not grown at the same pace that they are currently growing, in other words, the proceeds are this year are going to exceed, by, by estimates, about $10 million dollars. If they fail to continue to do that, then a new procedure would kick in. And that procedure would mean that a person who does not qualify for the lottery uh, as a dual qualifier, meaning that they have both the requisite ACT and GPA, would only receive $2,000 as a HOPE award. They could take that $2,000 and enroll at a community college or a university. If they choose to take that $2,000 and enroll at a university, and they are successful during their junior year, they can convert the $2,000 to a $4,000 uh, award. It comes into play 2015-16 only if lottery revenues dip below this benchmark that's being established this year. I might just stop there because it is, it's rather uh, intricate, and if there is any questions that, that you might have about the lottery-specific proposal, I'll try to answer that. Regent Ferris. Lottery bill that you know they've had all these discussions about the change in the you know the twenty one and the what, what, what it, else? It, it is not the only lottery bill. It is the uh, lottery bill that deals uh, most significantly 
with uh, eligibility criteria. There are some other, um, for lack of a better term, I'll call them boutique kinds of bills that are out there that are being discussed. One that would provide uh, lottery scholarships for students that are attending the Art Institute. Um, uh, uh, other bills that relate to uh, a program that is resident at Vanderbilt and the University of Tennessee called the Step Up Program that would give lottery money. This is the main. This is the main bill, but that, but by no means is the only bill that's kind of still in play. And I'll just mention one of those other bills to you because it does. This one impacts us. It's number two on your list, and. Uh, this would provide a uh, a benefit to our technology centers were uh, if it were to be enacted you may recall now that if a student initially um, is eligible for a hope award but chooses to first go through the technology centers use a wilder nafee grant can then convert that wilder nafee grant to a hope award but if a student first receives a hope award they can never receive a wilder nafee grant this bill, although it's limited in its form, would say that if a student uh, has a HOPE award and completes an associate degree, could then turn around and become eligible for a Wilder Nafee grant after that. Don't know whether this uh, um, legislation will pass, but uh, it would be an impact. It would be a positive impact to the technology centers if it were to pass. Next, then, um, I want to talk to you about the bills that uh, you specifically approved for the Board of Regents legislation. And this first one, I'm sorry to say, is hitting a snag. Uh, this bill came out of our retreat last year, and it would allow for an additional faculty uh, member and a student regent member for our board. And you may recall the way that uh, bill is proposed, it would not increase the number of voting members on our board, but it would allow for a faculty member to come on and sit in an observance role for a year, learn the process, understand the rhythm of the work that this board does, and then uh, become the voting member in the second year. Um, the, bill, the bill is moving along on one chamber uh, rather well. Um, there is a proposed amendment that would uh, remove the uh, or change the appointing authority uh, from the governor uh, to the respective speakers. And based upon that, uh, the bill has been placed in the General Subcommittee and Education Committee. The next bill comes out of the, um, Commissioner, comes out of the race to the top type legislation where our teacher programs are being evaluated uh, by the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. and. Um, we are asking for the ability to have access to the value added uh, data at the schools of education. I'd like to uh, thank Stephen Smith and others in the department who have been very helpful for us working through this measure and it has passed and is awaiting the governor's signature. Ne the next piece of legislation has to do with uh, exemption for blind vending and um, I, I need to say a special thanks to folks at the University of Memphis and MTSU for helping us work through um, a compromise between uh, the Regents institutions, University of Tennessee institutions, as, as well as the blind vending operations. At issue here was the ability for us to continue to provide quality food services, particularly at our student centers. As you know, we are uh, strongly into branded food services and the kinds of uh, student experiences that uh, every student's looking for when they come to a, a, a high quality university. And um, it, the statute just wasn't clear about whether or not there were uh, preferences that uh, we needed to give attention to uh, when seeking these kinds of uh, branded food services. So uh, there is an amendment that has been agreed to. The bill is moving through uh, the committees now. It makes it clear uh, that, we can, can, uh, that we are able to do our uh, food services, and those are in, within the domain of the public universities. At the same time, it allows the blind vending services to go forward with vending machines and counter services 
uh, in, in our facility. So uh, uh, they feel comfortable where they ended up, and it does uh, also give an advantage for us as well, at least clarifies the statute. The next bill has to do with a um, circumstance that came to our attention through the faculty subcouncil, and in I think our years of existence, we've had one case that um, uh, where we've had a, a tenured faculty member uh, win through the uh, court system and determine that they were um, wrongfully um, uh, wrongfully lost their tenure. And um, at, the, at the end of that process, it was determined that the, the individual could not receive uh, back compensation. This bill will allow the judicial chancellor to award back pay if this were to ever happen uh, again, does not mandate it, but would allow that as an appropriate uh, remedy. And that bill is moving through the committee system. And then finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the, uh, of the regents, we had a measure of housekeeping that um, allowed us to uh, remove from the code certain reporting, uh, outdated reporting requirements. And this also clarifies a situation you may recall from last year where uh, background checks are required for our uh, residence assistants in our uh, residence halls as well as anyone who has access to um, uh, uh, to keys in our dormitories would allow us to pay for those uh, background checks where currently they are, be re they are required to be paid by our students as well as the uh, janitorial staff. Mr. Chairman, that completes my report on uh, legislative activity. Thank you. Vice Chancellor, excuse me, Regent <laughs> Thomas. Uh, David, I want to go back to the bill that would uh, enlarge our board by a additional student and additional faculty non-voting member for a year. Yes, sir. Uh, you indicated that it had hit a snag and that uh, this amendment's been proposed in at least one chamber uh, that uh, would have the appointment system different. Is that a fatal snag or, to me, this is a very important change. I think that it is so important for our faculty and student regents to have this year of experience and then have a productive year as a voting member. And I would like to say, in my opinion, this is a significant piece of legislation that we ought to really push to get through this session. Uh, what's the status? Um, I, fatal is the word I'm not ready to, to use quite yet. Uh, life support probably is one I'm, I'm, uh, I'm probably ready to use. Um, again, um, th this seems to have the, the bill itself, the concept itself, uh, the, the idea of adding maturity to the board, all of that seems to be uh, very well vetted out, very well supported. It's just um, the appointing authority issue is one that's um, is, is what's got a snag. And unless we can figure a way to work through that, uh, I, I, I'm not willing to try to push forward a bill that would take away our chairman's ability to appoint. Yeah. Uh, let me add to that. Uh, during the lunch gathering, uh, we did bring that subject up with the governor and he had indicated that uh, he was going to talk with others to see if some uh, uh, compromise could be reached because he uh, fundamentally believes that to add the member is the right thing or to extend the term yeah. is the right thing to do. Good news. Uh, so while I share your concerns that it is on life support now, but I am encouraged by the governor's position on this issue, and I would echo Regent Thomas's comments that if any regents or others have any uh, contact with members on the Senate Education Committee, that they really let them know the fundamental basis for why we believe that this is an excellent thing to do. Thank you. I might add that the other two related boards, the higher education and UT, have that system already in place. I, uh, I think it's inexcusable that we can't have it, and I don't know what we can do about it, but thank I'll, you. I'll endeavor to continue to work on it. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? a personal shot at our two regents over here, I guess, right? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Next to the governor today. <laughs> no, it, absolutely, it not. is not. <laughs> yes, 
I, I would say uh, that um, uh, our student, Regent, uh, Regent Gatz, was yeah, asked testified. to come and testify on this bill, and he represented this board quite well. Exactly. Thank he you. said his voice was a little shaky, but beyond that, he did really, really well. None of us could detect that. I have the same problem, so I wouldn't feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Any other comments? Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, moving on with the agenda, next item is our new business. Uh, uh, these items will require action by the board. Uh, the first is uh, uh, the approval of new degree programs. Uh, I will call on Vice Chancellor Short uh, to make a presentation on that. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Dockett. Uh, we have one degree program before you today for your action. Uh, Columbia State Community College is proposing Associate of Applied Science in Advanced Integrated Industrial Technology. This new degree will be offered at the Northfield Workforce Development and Conference Center of the General Motors site at Spring Hill that many of you are familiar with. Uh, it is proposed in response to the vision of the South Central Tennessee Workforce Alliance that Northfield will become a regional training center for the resurgence of manufacturing in South Central Tennessee. And they view this program as a centerpiece uh, to meet that objective. It targets a diverse student population. It will provide dual enrollment opportunities for nine high schools within 20 minutes of the site. And while recruitment will focus on traditional students, courses will be delivered using online delivery, flexible scheduled labs to serve those who are currently in the workforce who want to increase their job skills. Tennessee Technology Center graduates can apply their earned credits to this AAS program. Uh, it's a 60 credit hour degree program it is an institutional priority for Columbia State uh, Community College because it responds to the renewed interest and growth in manufacturing in South Southern Middle Tennessee. General Motors projects an increase of over 1,000 employees at the Spring Hill site, and TEC projections are for 608 annual openings in this area statewide. There is a letter of support uh, that was submitted uh, from the South Central Tennessee Workforce Alliance uh, that indicates that funding will be available upon program approval um, by their board of directors. Uh, training of faculty will be funded by this Workforce Alliance. It's estimated at around $10,000. Space for the program will be offered at no cost through the Workforce Alliance as will funds for all equipment and one year of beginning faculty salary. They do plan to seek accreditation through the Association of Technology Management and Applied Engineering in fall of 2013. Uh, we've carefully reviewed this proposal. Uh, I'd like to commend Columbia State Community College, its president, Janet Smith, and the, her executive staff and the faculty for the development of an outstanding proposal, and we recommend your approval. Thank you. You have heard the recommendation from Vice Chancellor Short that we approve the uh, AS, excuse me, AAS in Advanced Integrity uh, Industrial Technology uh, Program at Columbia State College. Is there a motion to that effect? Motion by Regent uh, Reynolds, second by Regent Griskin. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposes no. Thank you. That matter is great. approved. That's great. Thank you. All righty. Uh, next item is the revision revisions to the following campus student disciplinary policies uh, at various campuses. Those campuses are Chattanooga State Community College, Cleveland State Community College, Jackson State Community College, Nashville State Community College, Mississippi State Community College. Volunteer State Community College, Walter State Community College, Tennessee State University, and the University of Memphis. Vice Chancellor Short. Thank you. 
At your board meeting uh, in December of 2011, you approved a separate student disciplinary policy for each of our universities and community colleges, as well as a student disciplinary policy for the TTCs. These policies describe um, disciplinary behaviors, disciplinary sanctions, uh, and due process in keeping with the system-wide rule and applicable statutes. Um, further, these policies do include traffic and parking procedures, including the statement of tracking and parking related fees and fines. Um, the revised system rule provides for institutions to amend their individual student disciplinary policy. Um, as such, in student uh, discipline policies, each institution may expand on these regulations subject to board approval. The revision process has included uh, institution-specific review of the policies that were approved in December 2011. Uh, and they have submitted uh, revisions to those policies that have been reviewed not only by my office, but the Office of General Counsel. So today there are nine institutions that have before you, uh, for your approval, revisions to their student disciplinary policies. Four of those institutions do contain changes in those fines and fees and parking, uh, and in most cases, those changes are because the fees currently um, required at those institutions are below what are required uh, as they look across multiple institutions of similar size and similar situation. And in one case, uh, case uh, the institution felt their fee was so low that it no longer served as a deterrent to student observing parking regulations and so forth. So we have before you nine institutional student disciplinary policies uh, that we are, we have reviewed, as I said, we've reviewed with legal counsel and we recommend approval on the part of the board today. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Short. Uh, you've heard her recommendation uh, that we make the revisions to the uh, uh, disciplinary policies at the nine institutions. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Move. Uh, moved by Regent Thomas, second by Regent Varlin. Uh, since this is a matter that uh, impacts fines and fees, it does in fact uh, require a roll call vote and I would call on Secretary to call the roll. Regent Copeland. Aye. Regent Duckett. Aye. Regent Ferris. Aye. Regent Gatz. Aye. Regent Griscom. Aye. Regent Huffman. Aye. Regent Markham. Aye. Regent Montgomery. Aye. Regent Reynolds. Aye. Regent Roddy, Aye. Regent Thomas, Aye. Regent Varlin, Aye. Regent Weeks. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Short. Uh, next item under new business is the approval of the March 26 uh, minutes of the special call meeting of the Finance and Business Operations Committee. Uh, it included uh, recommendation on the mandatory uh, and incidental fees, uh, as well as approval of the March 8th uh, minutes of the ad hoc committee on capital outlay. Uh, that included recommendations on the capital funding match program. And at this time, I would call on Regent Ferris uh, to give a report and update. Committee has been meeting on these fees. Uh, I don't know how many times we've had meetings, but but several meetings. Uh, and so you've got the minutes there before you of uh, of what we've been doing. Uh, we did have some things put in the minutes that we talked about specifically. I think Regent Barlin asked uh, concerning the. Uh, I think it was the the uh, the fee at MTSU. That uh, it was, or maybe it was Tom. The re the uh, the fee at MTSU that we would take a a second look at that, and we've got we actually put some language in the minutes to try to reflect uh, the intent of what the committee wanted to do. And so I want to make sure that all the regents are satisfied with with what we have there in the record, and if they are, uh, 
I'm going to move approval, and then if you want to change them or something like that, then we can do that as part of that if, or, or add to it. But I'll move approval of the minutes. Okay, I'll second. Thank you, Regent Ferris, for the motion to approve uh, the aforementioned items, and it is second by Regent Griscom. Is there any discussion uh, on the matter? Hearing none, since this doesn't involve uh, fiscal or has fiscal impact, uh, we, it is. it requires a roll call vote. And Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Regent Copeland. Aye. Regent Duckett. Aye. Regent Ferris. Aye. Regent Gatz. Aye. Regent Griscom. Aye. Regent Huffman. Aye. Regent Markham. Aye. Regent Montgomery. Aye. Regent Reynolds. Aye. Regent Roddy. Aye. Regent Thomas. Aye. Regent Varlin. Aye. Regent Weeks. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next item is the approval of the March 26 minutes of the special call meeting of the Personnel and Compensation Committee. Uh, that includes a recommendation on the compensation plan at Austin P. University. I would call on uh, Regent Montgomery for a report. Thanks, Vice Chair. For background, in September last year, uh, the Austin Peay State University requested permission to utilize the 2%, excuse me, to create a 4% salary pool for purposes of implementing a, their uh, compensation plan. Since the board's approved strategy is only a 2%, the board staff did not recommend that we do so at that time. Since then, the um, staff has reviewed it. They've come, made the conclusions that Austin Peay's current average faculty salaries were number one, they ranked among the lowest of the public institutions in Tennessee. Two, they are low when compared to peer institutions. Three, they are low when compared to the institutions in the same Carnegie classification. And last, they are low for all faculty ranks. So um, while comparative information is not readily available for staff, they also concluded that the staff were, were low as well. As a result of that, the Personnel Compensation Committee met earlier this week, and we agreed to accept the recommendation to um, approve Austin Please plan. And um, pending any questions that you may have, I move the approval of the minutes of the committee's report on March 26. The motion by Regent Montgomery to approve the minutes of the special call uh, meeting of the Personnel and Compensation Committee. Is there a second? second. It is second by Regent Copeland. Uh, any discussion on that matter? Hearing none, pursuant to our policy, uh, since this does involve compensation, it requires a roll call vote. Uh, and I call on the Secretary, please call the roll. Regent Copeland. Aye. Regent Duckett. Aye. Regent Ferris. Aye. Regent Gatz. Aye. Regent Griscom. Aye. Regent Huffman, Aye. Regent Markham, Aye. Regent Montgomery, Aye. Regent Reynolds, Aye. Regent Roddy, Aye. Regent Thomas, Aye. Regent Varlin, Aye. Regent Weeks. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The next item is the request to name the Mathematics and Computer Science Building at Austin P. State University, and I call on Chancellor Morgan. Thank you, Ms. Vice Chairman. Um, Upon the unanimous recommendation of a campus committee appointed in conformance with our policy on the name of buildings and facilities, uh, President Tim Hall from Austin P is requesting to name the Mathematics and Computer Science Building at Austin P State University the Maynard Mathematics and Computer Science Building. Um, you may have noticed in our uh, in the publication we looked at earlier the Austin P section um, there is a schematic of that building and it's. Uh, uh, frankly, it's quite impressive building, uh, particularly when you consider it's a $6.7 million, which is a lot of money, but in, compared to science buildings at uh, some schools, it's nothing. Yeah, so. <coughs> they, uh, they, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a beautiful uh, rendering, I think, will be a, a great addition to the campus. Uh, this naming is in recognition of the generosity of Jimmy Mader and his family to the university. The cumulative giving of Jimmy Maynard and his family exceeds $1.8 million. The Mathematics and Computer Science Building has an approximate cost of $7 million. 
The gift is comparable to circumstances of another recent project, which was the Hemlock Semiconductor Building, uh, with project costs of about $8 million, including equipment, and the value of Hemlock's gift was about $2 million. Uh, Jimmy Maynard and his family have become some of Austin Peay's most generous and engaged supporters over the year. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's my recommendation that Austin P. State University's new Mathematics and Computer Science Building be named the Maynard Mathematics and Computer Science Building. You've heard the recommendation from the cha Chancellor that we uh, name the Mathematics uh, and Computer Science Building after Jimmy Maynard. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Regent Roddy, second by Regent Montgomery. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposes no. Thank you. M motion is approved. Uh, at this stage, uh, we are at the end of the agenda. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, major oversight on my part. Uh, Tim Hall, President Hall, would you come forth? Because this is an important. Mr. Vice Chair and Chancellor and members of the Board of Regents, one of the things that makes being a president of a TBR institution one of the greatest jobs in the world is that you're constantly working to expand the family of your university or community college or tech center. And so I've, I've worked with the Maynard family now for several years, uh, getting together with them very regularly and learning about them and learning about their uh, devotion to the university and their concern for the university. And it's paid off, you've seen, in the generosity that they've displayed to the university. What I discovered along the way is that while I was trying to bring them into the Austin P family, they were making Austin P and our students part of their family. They run a family construction business, and every time we get together, it's brothers and sisters and father and mother and even the family cat sitting down to watch us all eat pizza. And Austin P is the beneficiary, and our students are the beneficiary of the fact that they've made us a part of their family, and we're very grateful for the board recognizing that and acknowledging their generosity in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Hall, and I apologize. Uh, and uh, but thank our chancellor for reminding me to to call on you. I had it here, and in my haste, I admitted omitted that. Uh, but the Maynards have been a tremendous friend of the TBR system, but more importantly, uh, Austin Peace. Uh, we're now at the end of the agenda. Uh, chancellor, are there any announcements? Um, just uh, uh, one item uh, I think was mentioned earlier, and I would, would just uh, repeat to what uh, Regent Weeks said. The, the next uh, Completion Academy is taking place Monday and Tuesday at the Cool Springs Marriott in Franklin. starts about 9 o'clock, I believe, on uh, Monday morning and runs through 4 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, on Tuesday, I think at 1.30 or about that, I think it's a session after lunch, the the governor is actually going to be there to moderate a session uh, on uh, higher education and workforce training. So it's uh, if you if you're in the area or so inclined, um, it it would not be a bad idea to drop by and, and just see what's going on because I think you'll be very pleased and, and proud of the action of the activity uh, of our institutions as they try to meet the goals that we talked about uh, earlier today. So that's it for me. All righty. The next uh, quarterly meeting of the Board of Regents will be in June, and it will be in, uh, held at Southwest uh, Tennessee Community College, uh, which is in, uh, I'll remember we're on camera, so I won't jump up and shout, in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, but uh, uh, we do look forward to seeing all of you uh, in attendance, and I do want to sincerely thank the presidents uh, of our various and directors of our various institutions for the time that you spend and again working with uh, the central staff and doing the things that you do uh, on your campus because uh, so often uh, the letters like many that I receive are the uh, complaining letters or the complaining calls on various things but uh, 
I and the members of the board do appreciate you taking the time to, to help uh, further enhance the higher education in the state. Uh, and I'll ask my fellow, uh, fellow colleagues any comments uh, that any of you would like to make. Uh, if not, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>